across mobile devices and desktop and telephones. Um, the sunshine law. Please note that this meeting is being held electronically via Zoom virtual meeting service and will be conducted in conformance with all regulations of the sunshine law. Proper notice has been given to the township website and sent to the newspapers of record. The agenda for the meeting this evening, as well as the instructions for the public participation in the meeting have also been posted on the town website and sent to the newspaper of record. The agenda items will not necessarily be heard in the order listed and the meeting will not continue past 10.30 p.m. Mike Coviello, uh, comments on the Zoom, please. Certainly. All applicants and their professionals, along with residents to ask questions in reference to that application, will get a chance. You are in the uh, meeting tonight on mute and will be brought off mute when it's time to speak. We will look for your hand physically or virtually or a comment in the chat. Thank you, Mr. Coviel. And Regina, roll call, please. Mr. Sullivan. Present. Mr. Cyburn. Here. Mr. Nappy. Here. Mr. D'Elia. Here. Mr. Coviello. Here. Mr. Sylvester. Here. Mr. Ringwood. Here. Mr. Parada. Here. And we have Ms. Amanda Wolf, our attorney this evening, will be joining us shortly. Correct. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And let's move on to the some of our housekeeping items to, to review the minutes from October 22nd, 2020. Uh, Mr. Sylvester? I was not in okay. attendance that night, so thank I you, can't Mr. Sylvester. And I think Mr. Ringwood may have been uh, off-site that day as well. Mr. You're breaking up, Ray. I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Ray. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I've had a chance to read the minutes, and the minutes are in order. Yeah. I'll make a motion for approval. Uh, we have a motion by Mr. Coviello, a second. I'll second, Mr. Chairman. By Mr. Cyburn. Uh, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, all. That was across the board. Application 22-20, this is adoption of resolution. Can everyone hear me okay on the, the board? Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is the Butler Residence 163 Gallinson Drive, block 3902, lot 18. This was an elevated deck, rear yard setback, and a vegetation row. Did anyone have an opportunity to review the resolution, Mr. Coviello? I had a chance to read it. The was everything in order. In order? I'll make a motion for approval. Thank you. And may I have a second by Mr. Delia, please? I'll second. We have a second by Mr. Delia and a roll call on 2220. Oh, hold on, Regina. There you go. All right. Mr. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan. I think he froze again for a moment. Okay. Yes. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. Delia? Yes. Mr. Coviello? Yes. Mr. Pareda? Yes. Motion carries five zero. Thank you very much. Moving on to application 2120. This is the current residence, 81 Cedar Green Lane, block 2801, lot 52, uh, off of Mountain Avenue. And this was a patio with a uh, 10 foot side yard setback. Did anyone have an opportunity, Mr.
Cyburn. Yes, I had opportunity to review the resolution and it's in order. Thank you. May I get a motion, Mr. Cyburn? Yes. May I, I move. get a second by Mr. Delia, please? Uh, second. And a second by Mr. Delia. Roll call, Regina, please. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. Delia? Yes. Mr. Cobiello? Yes. Mr. Pareda? Yes. Five zero. Thank you all. And application 19 20. This is the Sanders residence. Uh, one of two swimming pools that we heard that evening 51 Holly Glen, block 3502, lot six. Uh, we did spend some, some significant time regarding the conditions on this swimming pool. And Mr. Coviello, can I get a motion, please? I read the resolution. It is in order, and I'll make a motion for approval. Mr. Coviello, and a second by Mr. Parita, please. I second that. Thank you very much, Mr. Parita. And a roll call on 1920, please. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. D'Elia? Yes. Mr. Cobiello? Yes. Mr. Pareda? Yes. Five zero. Thank you very much. And moving on to application 2320. This is the Sayer Residence, 53 Orion Road, Block 3401, Lot 6. This was the second swimming pool of the evening. We spent some time on the set back a vegetation row. And I believe it's us. May I get a motion and a comment for Mr. Cyburn, please? I found the resolution to be order and I move to approve. Thank you very much, Mr. Cyburn. And can I get a second, Mr. Coviello? I'll second. And we have a second by Mr. Coviello and a roll <clears throat> call on 2320, please. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. D'Elia? Yes. Mr. Coviello? Yes. Mr. Pareda? Yes. Five zero. Thank you very much. And that concludes our housekeeping. Um, Mr. Chairman, should we yes. let the record reflect that at 740, Amanda Wolf has joined audio and video. Great. Thank you. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you very much. And Regina, if you could just address Ms. Wolf's attendance, please, for the record. Yes. Thank you. And the set list for this evening we will hear we have three significant items for this evening one will be a swimming pool on princeton followed by 391 springfield Field avenue and a matter for the board this is a state requirement for municipal land use for zoning boards. So with that said, let's move on to application 2420. This is the La Rosa party, 154 Princeton Avenue, block 1708, lot one in the R15 zone. And if the La Rosa family can please be unmuted and Ms. Wolf will have a few comments before we start this evening. And real quick, Ms. La Rosa, do you have any professionals here with you this evening? Um, yes, I do. I'm represented by uh, Jerry Gouldy from Anthony and Sylvan Pools and Brian Leff from BML Studios and Morgan Engineering. And I see that they're both here. Okay, and, so we'll unmute uh, Mr. Gold. And the other was? Um, Brian Leff. He's raising his hand. Hi, Brian. And you're both uh, have the ability to unmute? Okay. Okay, so for the record, I did review the notice as to form and content, and it was sufficient in timeliness for the mailing and the publication. So the board does have jurisdiction to hear this application. And before we start, I will swear in all of our witnesses. So if you would all raise your right hand, thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? 
I do. I do. Thank you. And then when you testify, just give me your name and address. Um, do I go first? <laughs> yes, back to you. So if you just want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. So um, I live at 154 Princeton Avenue with my two teenage sons. And um, we live at the end of a cul-de-sac. Um, and uh, we have, uh, obviously we have a real street in front of our house and then two paper streets that have never been developed and a large forest um, off to the left of our house. We're interested in installing an in-ground pool um, and we're very careful to, um, to work with Anthony and Sylvan and Mr. Leff and Morgan Engineering to make sure that we met the requirements um, after we were initially declined um, and a variance was requested. Um, I think it's probably better if they speak to um, the elements of compliance um, more than I do since I, can, I think they can speak to it more eloquently than I can. Um, but we're interested in an in-ground pool with a hot tub and we already have a fence in place. Okay, and can you tell us what triggered the variances? You received a letter of denial from our zoning officer, Tom Bacco, and can you tell us about the contents and the dialogue that you had with Mr. Bacco? The fundamental issue, I think, was that because of the paper streets, um, what I call our backyard is in fact considered a front yard or a couple of front yards, um, and I think that's where the main snag has come in. Okay, and uh, impervious coverage, was that another topic of discussion? Um, it was a topic of discussion, and I think Mr. Leff can speak to that better than I can okay. um, in terms of coverage. All right, great. Thank you very much. So why don't we hear from the pool professionals, but we'd like Ms. LaRosa, if you could stick tight, the board will have some additional questions for you. Oh, sure. definitely. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if we could have, uh, I believe Brian is going to yes. speak. Yes. Good evening. Name is Brian Leff. Last name is spelled L-E-F-F. -F, and I am currently the president of BML Studio in Barnegat, New Jersey. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Mr. Leff. And can I have your address for the record? Uh, 11 Periwinkle Drive in Barnegat, New Jersey is the business address. Thank you. All right. As I mentioned, I am a professional planner. Uh, I've testified in front of numerous boards throughout the state, uh, including Berkeley Heights Planning Board just last month, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I'm asking that I be accepted as a professional. Uh, yes, thank you. And if you can continue to proceed, thank you. Okay. Thank you. If, if I could, what I'd like to do is just share my screen uh, just with a copy of the plan that was submitted. I might help things to help everyone follow along with what I'm talking about as I go along. So it's a pleasure of the board. I'd like to share my screen. Yep, give me one second to do, do that. I am not getting that tonight. <coughs> I am so, let's see, here we go. You should have ability. Okay, yes, we do. All right, can everyone see that screen? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, what that is is a copy of the plan that was submitted. Uh, it's part of the application package. I don't know if we want to give it a specific uh, exhibit name, uh, A1. If it's the same as was submitted, we don't need to mark it. Okay. It, it has been submitted. This is just a copy. Okay, perfect. What was the last revised date, just so I have it? 10-29-20. Um, perfect. Thank you. All right. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time in listening to this. We are here for a property known as Track or a block 1708, lot one, is shown on the Berkeley Heights tax map. It's commonly known as 154 Princeton Avenue. As shown on the tax map, the track is uniquely configured with frontage on three roadways, 104 feet of frontage on the Princeton Avenue cul-de-sac, 175 feet of frontage on Central Street, 100 feet on Yale Avenue. I'm sorry, hey, Brian, just, 
I had received a revised set of plans that have different numbers that I'm looking at here. Uh, the revised set of plans was dated, uh, it looks like 1031. And what I'm looking at where in your top left where it says 38.8, it now says 34.4. Um, that's, what I'm, that's what I have as well on the Central Avenue side, Mike. That's correct. Yes. The rear now shows 23 and the right shows 16. Uh, it also has a highlighted green circle around the hot tub as well as in a highlighted green around the walkway that looks like it leads from the deck to the coping. Yeah, it's, I have the same one as well. Yeah. So I think that the one that you're supplying was the original one and when revised plans were submitted, we got something a little bit different. Okay, I, there's a I apologize. I'm only aware of a single submission. I, I have a larger copy. It might be that one there. It's, what, does anyone know what the difference was between the plans? Is it material or is it just the markups that you're referring to? Well, I, I can't speak to that. What I can speak to uh, that are currently different are the measurements. One measurement is to the pool, one measurement is to the sidewalk. So where it says uh, on the central street side where you have 38.8 to the pool, yes. underneath that is a red line on mine that says 34 plus 34 feet plus or minus. That's what I'm looking at as well. From All the right. hot tub, you've got the 25.4, then there's a red line that says 23 feet. And again, that is from the sidewalk. And so who's, yeah. who's the red line, whose red lines are they? I have. I don't know. No, no. I Excuse me. Uh, I I do have that copy in my packet. Yeah. Here's the two smaller uh, pages, the one with the red markings and the green on it, but then there's a, a larger size piece uh, with that in it. Yeah, the one with the red markings says 20 scale at the bottom. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm going to defer to the other expert from Anthony Sylvan Pools who may be able to shed some light on the difference of the two plans. I apologize, I wasn't aware of a second plan that was submitted. Yeah, it looks like there's a plan revision dated. I'm looking at 11520. I don't have that either. So let's mark it as an exhibit and we'll mark it as exhibit A1. Could someone share that with me so I can look at it? <laughs> I have one revised 81120. Now, I think the issue is there was a set of plans that were originally done that we used uh, prior and that those those plans were, were meant to make sure the application was able to be submitted. We then received a second set of plans because uh, even on the large one that we have, it says revised, received 10-31-20. So that one was received by the zoning board 10-31. Uh, and then again, the one I'm, I'm looking at, and it may be hard to see, looks like it's hard to see, but it looks like this on the top right hand corner where it says revised plans. And it is a large scale piece that was cut down the side to just show really the plot plan. But there are some extra markings and measurements as well as some highlighted areas. The board didn't make these. These would have come from one of the professionals. Yeah. OK. And like I said, I, I am not aware of that. Jerry, are you aware of that at all? Yeah, this is Jerry Goldie from Anthony Sylvan Pools. Uh, I'm not the copy of the plan that I got that said revised. I wondered if maybe the town didn't do it because the original plan did not have the uh, jacuzzi, the hot tub, and the three foot walk. So they okay, were. Well, I let's 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 just cut to the chase here. If yeah. if th this application has a lot of holes in it, and I I think it makes sense. We're all going to be going around in circles talking about what the numbers are. I think we need to take this from from ground zero and revise the plans. Be crystal clear with what the dimensions are. Make sure that our numbers are accurate, and then come back at another time because I, I we cannot afford to spend forty five minutes discussing numbers. Well, I am prepared to testify on the plan that is dated ten twenty nine, the one that I know of that was officially submitted with the application. But the, where are those where, marks you're looking from? No one seems to know. Yeah, and I'm looking at a plan revision dated eleven one, as Mr. Coviello has indicated, and Mr. Mr. D'Elia with 
red markings and different numbers. Right. The, that's the plan that no one knows where that came from. Okay. Chairman, so then, then we're was, not it, ready. It does not appear that it was submitted by the applicant, is my point. So I'm not sure that that, has, that plan has any relevance on this application. Any, Chairman? Yes, Mr. Delia. I, I do have the copy of the revised admission in my packet. I have, I have the two smaller, like you said, half plot plans, and I do have the full one, yes. the revised one. It's not in anybody else's packet. Uh, well, I, I have the revised plan as well. I have the revised. I have yes. the full and the revised. Yep, I yes. do too. Hang on. But I'm just the attorney. So as long as the engineering is good, we're okay. Okay, so I would like to know for the record what the exact measurement is from Central Street, from Yale Avenue, and from the side yard setback. From Central what? Street, the setback to the pool is 38.8 feet. 38.8, that's the number. Okay, now on Yale Street. On Yale Street, the setback to the spa is 25.4 feet and the setback to the pool is 27.4 feet. Hey, hey, Ray. Yes, Mr. Ringwood. So if you look at the red markings and you look at the differences between the plan that Mr. Leff is referring to and the revised plan, right, it those might be distances are to the, are to the, to to the, the concrete, the concrete, concrete, not to the pool where his markings are to the pool. All right. And it's a right. appropriate Appreciate I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I can't hear what you're saying. In the eyes of zoning, it should the, the numbers should reflect to the water's edge. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, now I can. Yes. Okay. To the water's edge. So as Mr. Ringwood had mentioned, we've got the 25.4 feet to the spa which is the Yale Avenue. We've got 38.8 to the, from Central Avenue to the water feet on the side yard setback. So it's appropriate. Jerry, did you hear me okay? No, you I didn't. Were in, you, no. you were in and out, right? In and out, okay. Central, Central Street, 38.8 to the water's edge. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, Yale Avenue, 25.4 to the water's edge, which is the spot. That's right. Okay. That's and then on the side yard setback, which is the southern side of the parcel, the side yard setback is... 20 feet. 20 feet, that's correct. 20 yes. feet. Yes. Correct. Yes. So, Mr. Leff, we'll let you continue with your Everyone, testimony. Take me to the water's edge on yep. the uh, side yard setback. Now we okay, so now we have the pool set in the what is considered the La Rosa's rear yard, even though it triggers front yards setbacks. So why don't we have uh, Mr. Leaf continue? Okay. So, so regarding the pool and the impervious coverage. Okay. So getting back to my testimony, uh, Princeton Avenue is an improved public roadway. Although it's shown on the tax map, Central, Ab Central Street and Yale Avenue do not currently exist. Those are paper streets. Similarly, the tax map depicts Princeton Avenue as spanning continuously between Mountain Avenue and Park Avenue. And although portions of Princeton Avenue are improved, the road's not continuous. It terminates at, this, at the subject track with a cul-de-sac. And then it continues for a small stretch as you get closer to Park Avenue, but it's not continuous as it shows on the tax map. Now, in addition to the setbacks and other zoning requirements, 
This site is also uniquely impacted by a 20 foot wide drainage easement that runs the full length of the northern and eastern property lines. The property is 16,671 square feet in size and is currently developed with a single family home and associated deck, driveway, and other typical residential scale improvements. The applicant is proposing to improve the property with an in-ground pool in the rear yard. While the pool will appear to be located in accordance with all setbacks and other zoning regulations, the unique configuration of the lot causes the need for relief from a few bulk zoning standards within the R15 zone. These include a pool provided in the front yard area where pools are prohibited from being in the front yard and a deviation from the other coverage where 10% of other coverage is permitted and 12.7% is proposed. The proposal otherwise complies with the overall coverage requirement. Now there are several other existing nonconformities and they're associated with the unique configuration of the lot. This includes a front yard setback to Princeton Avenue and Yale Avenue, an existing generator which is located within the Central Avenue front yard area. These variants are a direct result of the number of frontages and the creation of the cul-de-sac along Princeton. None of these conditions will be exaggerated or impacted in any way as a result of the proposed improvements. Looking at the variance, the, the primary variance being sought is to construct a pool within the front yard area where the same is prohibited. Now the track contains frontage on three streets. Essentially the whole lot is a front yard and this is a clear hardship to the property owner. Right. The proposed pool will be located in the front yard area of Yale Avenue. This is an unimproved paper street. The area is currently vacant and wooded. To the average person, the pool will appear to be in the backyard where it belongs, and the variance wouldn't be obvious. Granting this variance allows the homeowner to enjoy their property in a manner consistent with other properties throughout the community, which are not impacted by this unique condition. As the pool is otherwise located within the pool setback requirements of the ordinance, there are no negative impacts associated with the granting of this variance. Secondly, we're seeking a variance for the other impervious coverage. A maximum total impervious coverage of 25% is permitted within the R15 zone. And this breaks down to a 15% building cover, 10% other, and, and, and a 25% combined. The proposed improvements will result in a combined cover of 25%, which is consistent with the ordinance. However, a total of 12.7% of cover will fall under the category of other whereas the ordinance permits the maximum other cover of 10%. Now, without maximizing the builder building cover on any given site, the combined cover cannot be achieved without a variance. This encourages large homes on small lots with little opportunity for other improvements such as patios, decks, pools, and other common amenities. The existing home represents a building cover of 9.7%, whereas a maximum of 15% is permitted. So as the structure is far below the maximum size permitted within the zone, the balance of the permitted cover is being utilized for the proposed improvements. Stormwater runoff is typically the main concern when cover limits are exceeded. And as the improvements will result in a combined cover, which complies with the ordinance, the storm runoff characteristics will also remain compatible with expectations of the ordinance. So there are no negative impacts associated with the granting of this variance. So in conclusion, the applicant is seeking to construct a residential pool within the backyard area of 154 Princeton Avenue. Due to the unique configuration of the track, some relief from the Berkeley Heights Land Development Ordinance is being sought. In my professional opinion, the relief being sought may be granted without impairment to the zone plan or zoning ordinance, will not result in any detrimental impacts to the health, safety, morals, or general welfare of the public. And that concludes my direct testimony, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, gentlemen from the okay. Hearing no one. Um, was Anthony Sylvan Poole going to make a few comments? I the only comments I would make, I mean, you have the dimensions on the pool. It's a 20 by 40 gunite pool. Uh, got a three foot walk around the outside. We're coming in up the drive side. Uh, we're not impacting or going on anyone else's property to do it. 
uh, we excavate the pool, remove the dirt, and that's taken off site. So basically, I'm open to any questions that uh, you might have. Okay. But the, the excavation doing. points that you have come up. Uh, okay. The can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can now. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. There's something wrong with, with my system. I think. Okay. You've got the driveway. You'll you'll access all truck and equipment will access the driveway and then turn left and follow the left side of the property to get to the rear yard. That's correct. Okay. So you've got a 20 foot drainage easement on the uh, north side and a 20 foot drainage easement on the east side. Yep. The, yes, sir. So tractors and, and trucks and cement mixers and the like will be traversing over the drainage easement. Okay. This application, should it advance, will need a, a hold harmless agreement to be engaged with the town and subject to the review and approval of the township engineer because these are the existing grade. There are already existing drainage patterns with this easement. I'm fairly okay. certain that the Yale Avenue, start, the water flow starts from Mountain Avenue, accelerates and picks up speed and works its way down to Park Avenue and then eventually to the Passaic River. Uh, we need to ensure that the grade as it exists is not compromised and sheet flow is not altered. So there okay. will be some provisions that will be required. And again, subject to the review and the approval of the township engineer. And uh, we will need to engage in a hold harmless agreement prior to the start of construction. I understand. <clears throat> Ms. LaRosa, do you understand that as well? I do. Okay, great, thank you. I, I, I apologize for cutting out on this. Uh, Surface Pro I'm working on. Uh, gentlemen from the board, questions or comments for the La Rosa application? Um, so you, there were some pictures that were submitted. I don't know if we need to enter these into evidence, but I want to discuss some of the pictures. Okay. They were submitted more than 10 days in advance. We do not. But if it's easier to mark them just so you can discuss them, that might make sense. They are labeled very nicely, photo one through uh, five, I believe. Okay, so we can just go with that. So in photos one and three, there appears to be a shed and some sports gear on the outside of the fence, which is outside of your property line? Yes, sir, that belongs to my next door neighbors. So that's not your fence or your sporting equipment? Uh, the fence is mine. The, uh, I don't see a sporting equipment in that picture. Photo three. Oh, okay. Can we? Oh, the oh the lacrosse equipment. <laughs> that's that's mobile. Photo three. That's my son's, and it's it's he he moves his lacrosse bounce backs all around. They are in fact outside of our fence and on township property. Okay, so th those will be removed as a condition of approval. Okay, and the lands you're you're entitled to improve and work within the lands that you own. Anything that is any lands that are not owned, regardless of if it's a paper street or open space, needs to be left in its natural situation. If the leaves fall, the twigs fall, the trees fall, it cannot be altered. You can't blow the leaves. You can't dump leaves in that area. It needs to be left in its natural state because it compromises the township's ability to apply for grants for DEP and open space grants. So it needs gotcha. to be left in a natural state. Okay. And then my only other uh, more of a comment, uh, we heard from Jerry uh, about stormwater management. Uh, I'm gonna leave that up to our township engineer. As with all pools, we ask uh, for the township engineer to decide whether stormwater management plan uh, is needed or not. Understood. Other than that, I mean- the And it looks like you do have provisions for a uh, seepage tank, correct? That would be from Mr. Leff. I okay. the plans. Yeah, I don't believe there is any seepage tank being proposed. Yeah, I'm I didn't certain. see one on there. It, the, 
Oh, it's the, I'm sorry. It's the pool equipment. The pool, it, yeah, we have the pool equipment, which is located within the the pool, the setback sir, area. It, it resembles. It does. It does. A, you know, a swimming pool, a, a, an additional 1,300 square foot of coverage would require a stormwater management. But as Mr. Coviello had mentioned, that would be subject to the review and approval of the township engineer should the application advance. Other than that, I have no questions or comments. Mr. Perita? Uh, yeah, the only question I have, uh, looking at the plan here, uh, towards the top on the eastern side, there's a mention of removing an existing fence. Which fence is that referring to? Is it in the picture, in one of the pictures? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can answer that, Jen. Okay. Um, so we had a fence. Um, how do I say this? We had a fence before, and we expanded it to the borders of the property. And what that is referring to is where the fence was before it was expanded. That has since been pushed back to the property border. It was the same fence. It was just removed from where it previously stood. And that was oh. permitted, correct? Yes, of course. Okay, perfect. Um, and just to be clear, that shed on the right side there in the picture, that's your neighbor shed? It is. Okay. All right. That's all the only questions I had. Thank you, Mr. Perita. Mr. Ringwood. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ringwood. Mr. D'Elia, please. Uh, nothing. Uh, Mr. Cyburn. No, I don't have anything further on this application either. I'd, I'd like to make a motion to open up the meeting to members of the public. May I have a motion, Mr. Coviello? I'll make a motion. And a second by Mr. Cyburn. And I am going to. Thank you. The meeting is now open to members of the public that have a question or comment regarding the La Rosa parcel uh, proposed rear yard swimming pool. So please, by show of virtual or physical hand or mention in the chat, please let me know if you'd like to be heard on this application. Mr. Chairman, I am not seeing anybody. We can give it another few yeah, seconds, but I am seeing second. no one. And while we're waiting, I want to thank Mr. Goldie and Mr. Leaf for their presentations this evening. And we would like to thank Ms. LaRosa regarding her testimony and some of the comments. Okay. Thank, you. thank you for the hearing. So Mr. Chairman, seeing nobody, I'd make a motion to close to members of the public. We have a motion by Mr. Coviello, a second by Mr. D'Elia, please. Second. A second by Mr. D'Elia. Okay. Um, gentlemen, any additional comments? I, I think we covered most of the bases. Personally, I I'm sensitive to the easements. I just want to make sure that the easements are not compromised. I don't want to change grade and existing drainage patterns to cause an adverse condition downhill or on another neighboring property. One of the fortunate graces with this parcel fronting three, you have two paper streets and a, and a large wooded area, which is uh, technically considered the borough open space program. So I, I don't think we will have an adverse impact in that area and the neighbors across Yale and back towards Cornell are probably not even going to see this pool. I would be in favor of this application as presented considering the whole harmless agreement in place and a silt fence along the Central Avenue side to ensure that all um, construction activity takes place 100% on the La Rosa parcel. And those That's are fine. We'll do that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Hold harmless has to be put in place prior to prior to construction. Yeah. Construction. Yeah. May I ask one quick question? Sure. Um, so about six months ago, there were some uh, trees that were in, uh, dying or in danger of falling and outside of our property line and the township removed them. And the neighbors directly behind me, I was speaking with them about the potential pool and they didn't have a problem with it, but they raised concern that the trees that were taken down by the township, the dead trees are still there on the ground. And they had concerns that that might interfere with the water drainage in the, in the creek, if you will, that goes behind my house and theirs. I'm sure. The, uh, did they voice their concern to the borough engineer or the tree inspector? I don't know. Okay. I, I, they, yeah. they can, but the trees are to remain in their natural state. 
Okay. Um, the tree, the, your, the DPW removed the tree because it may have uh, re felled a tree and left the tree because the tree belongs in the woods. The tree should not be carted off and chipped up. Um, if there are concerns, I know that the town has done some significant drainage work, whether or not they are going to uh, investigate the middle of the woods, I don't know. But um, if someone wants to express a concern, they can contact Tom Bucca, the tree inspector. Very good, thank you. Um, any other board members with a question or comment? Hearing no one, uh, Ms. Wolf, can you go over some of the conditions that we've discussed? Sure, I believe that we discussed the hold harmless prior to construction, the silt fence, um, if any trees are being removed, aside from the ones that have already been removed, you need to get a permit. Um, we have to remove the lacrosse equipment from the township property. And oh, I, I did have one more. Stormwater management as reviewed from the engineer. Perfect. And any, any staging uh, needs to be 100% on the parcel. The staging for the job cannot take place in the street. We can't stockpile any equipment or you know trucks should come do their job and leave each day we, we can't use the end of the cul-de-sac as a staging area we understand that's the way we work in all towns thank you right thank you i think that about covers and, it. And one more uh i'm sorry to, amanda um there is a basketball court at the end of the street do you own the basketball court i do okay um it's not in the, bar, the zoning board's jurisdiction. However, I just want to be clear for the record that the Board of Adjustment does not encourage children's play in the street. Basketball courts should be in a driveway or in a basketball court at a school ground. Um, it's not our responsibility to enforce. I just want to state it for the record if, because the jurisdiction is the police department because it's a product in the right of way, but I'm I'm just letting you know. Fair enough, thank you. It will not be, it's not a condition of resolution, but it it should be mentioned for the record that the Board of Adjustment does not encourage children to play in a right of way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, I'm finished with my comments, thank you. And I think we've heard all the testimony. I believe we heard that this might be a C1 undue hardship given the multiple street frontages paper or otherwise, and the drainage easements. So I think the board can deliberate and vote on the other coverage and the setback deviations. Amanda, we appreciate that. Considering all the testimony this evening and the guidance as provided by our attorney, may I get a motion on this application, please? I'll make a motion for approval, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion by Mr. Coviello. May I have a second by Mr. Ringwood this evening? Second. And a second by Mr. Ringwood and a roll call. Regina, please. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. Nappy? Yes. Mr. D'Elia? Yes. Mr. Coviello? Yes. Mr. Sylvester? Yes. Mr. Ringwood? Yes. 7-0. Congratulations and good luck with your 2021 Sylvan Pool. Thank you so Thank you much, much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you for everything. Thank you for your time and consideration. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Hey, Regina, are you okay? Yes. Thank you. And moving on to application, this is a continued this is application 1720391 Springfield Avenue, block 2801, lot 20. And we'd like to have the professional step forward. And so, uh, Mr. Santori, who else would you like to see unmuted at this time with you? Um, well, we have um, Ms. Dougherty, which is the architect. We have Mr. Hollows and Mr. Toby as the planner. And I've brought Mr. Uh, Hughes and Ms. Lasalfaro also have the ability uh, to unmute themselves at this time. Mr. Hughes. Um, 
just to, to help move the process along, I'm just, Mr. Santori, I'm going to start and then I'd like you to make a comment and then it looks like we're at the planning stage. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Mr. Sullivan, I think there's a couple uh, items that we could do some high level uh, indications on the changes that have been done. Ms. Dougherty can walk us through the reconfiguration of the downstairs space in the existing uh, building. And okay. also we have obviously Mr. Toby with the planning. We have Mr. Hollis with a few minor engineering changes, um, which if Mr. Sofaro doesn't need to be with us for too, too long tonight, we could do those first. It's totally up to your desire, right. but we can move it however you like to. What I'm thinking about doing, I just want to recap where the board was when we left. Was it uh, September 24th or something like that? Yes. Yep. yes. In September, the board was, we spent a few hours on this application and the board seemed to have uh, some concerns regarding the use of the ground floor. And I think the board was leaning on the leaving it at, in the commercial position. And then we were also sensitive with the overall density and the size of the project. Um, I think the board, I would like to do a straw poll on the board right now, just to reiterate where, what the feeling is regarding habitable dwelling on the ground floor, because you still have a unit proposed on the ground floor, correct? Yes. Okay. Personally, I am of the opinion that Commercial belongs on the ground floor, and we can discuss residential units and a and a reasonable number of residential units on floors two, three, and the second building. I'm very concerned about the density, but I just want you to know what, what I, how I feel about the habitable dwelling on the ground floor, and I want to go board member by board member, which will allow Mr. Toby a couple of extra minutes to plan his uh, planning as well as Mr. Keenan may have some some comments as well after Mr. Tobia. The batting order that I think we go is, I'll finish my comments, we'll let the board straw poll. Mr. Santori, you could take over. We'll have Mr. Tobia talk and we'll have Mr. Keenan talk. Um, I don't know how much, let's use the first couple of minutes for Mr. Sofaro and Mr. Hollows. I don't think we need to go too heavy into the engineering portion of it. And I would like, as much as we love to see them, I'd like to dismiss them on the earlier side if we really don't need to further any testimony. So with that said, I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Cyburn for a comment, followed by Mr. Coviello, and we'll go that way. Uh, I have reviewed uh, the, the changes that were made and I'm still, um, from the first meeting that we had on the 24th, I still would like to see commercial on the ground floor out on the street. I'm pretty firm on that. Okay, Mr. Coviello? Yeah, I too am opposed to residential on the ground floor or first floor and uh, it, density, overall density was my other issue. Mr. Nappy? Yes, I concur with the other board members. I would like to see retail remain on the, on the first floor as well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Parita? I think I agree with the retail on the first floor. And I believe another issue that came up the last time was the number of parking spots as it relates to the number of units that are going to be in the building. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify with, with the ground floor, my concern is not that it's solely retail, that it's commercial. Commercial. Yep. And I say commercial because right now only 20% of the ground floor would need to be retail based on the ordinance. So I'm, I would be okay if there was no retail, but it were commercial, not living space. I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Ringwood? I, I echo Mr. Coviello's comments. Thank you, Mr. D'Elia? Um, I'm not as concerned with the ground floor uh, as much as I am with the density uh, because of a couple factors, one, uh, the, the design of the building the way it is, uh, it, it really would be tough to have retail in there. Um, if you're saying commercial as in offices or something, that, that might work a little better, uh, but retail. Um, and, and the other factor, I think there's a lot of vacant retail in town now um, to force them to have more retail uh, 
I, I'm more concerned with the uh, density. Okay. Now I just want to backpedal again. You are you're okay. You're in favor of commercial. Uh, what about the habitable dwelling on the ground floor? Um, I, again, I'm more concerned with the density than I am with the okay. residential on the first floor. I appreciate your comments. And Mr. Sylvester, please. Ray, I yeah. drove the whole block of Springfield in town and saw 18 retail spaces available that are not in, inhabited right now. So are we gonna approve three more commercial or retail spaces that no one's gonna probably rent? And is that that's gonna bring it up to 21? Uh, as far as the um, uh, putting a, an apartment or whatever, there are 16 houses on Springfield on either side, the, the whole street that are, I know they're old and built a long time ago, but there are retail, there are homes that close to the street. So I, I get the density, but I'm not against uh, making it uh, into apartments. Uh, and, cons and, and you would consider the ground floor as well, is that? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Santor, you know this board for several years and you know we always work together to create a better product. And I, I, in the spirit of that, I'm gonna hand it over to you for comments. And if you wanted to start and then we'll have the engineers talk and then we'll let the, uh, the planners uh, exchange their points of view and reports, I think that's the better way to go. And I wanna ask you for your concurrence and how do you feel? Sure, absolutely, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, I think that's uh, perfectly fine. You know, just by way of comment, uh, you know, as much as a resident, as an attorney, and obviously someone who appears before this board extremely regularly, and I respect this board, and it's, it's honestly, the, in my opinion, the best board that I appear before because of the, the transparency and the integrity and the consistency of the board. And, um, and I do appreciate it because it makes my job, you know, easier to understand. Uh, but I have to tell you, this is probably the first time I've disagreed with you guys in it, probably ever uh, on this because this is one of these projects where we have 25 years of hindsight that retail's never worked. It just doesn't work. It's not set, it's not set up for retail. It doesn't look like retail. It, when you walk into the building, it's got an open staircase. It doesn't feel like anything to do with retail. Um, so, you know, I understand the desire for the commercial space elements and components, and, and I, I do. Um, but I guess, you know, the issue becomes of one where this is obviously you have the 1995 zoning board resolution that approved this for uh, an office space or somewhat of a use. Even back then at that point, they were commenting and that's now, you know, literally 25 years ago, they're commenting at that point how the building's just not working for retail and, and that was that. And now you, you fast forward all these years and it still never worked. So this concept and idea and theory that this is something that we want it to be, that it's not, it's just not. And as we go down the road, we look at, we have you know EMO, whatever the medical office is there, that's not retail. You have Walgreens, which is what it is standalone. And then as you go through the rest of it, there really isn't, as you, know, as you continue down Springfield Avenue, it's not like there's this co continuity of retail that you would see. So I guess that's what I'm struggling with from my perspective what I thought and what I liked about this project in terms of converting the first floor to um, residential was it feels like a New York City building with the open staircase kind of walk up concept. You can walk up. It was suited for the, the way that it looks interior when you walk into it. It doesn't have a retail feel. It never did. It was never designed that way. Um, so obviously the conversion happened in 95 office uh, space was um, accepted and theoretically permitted at that, well, permitted at that point in time. So when we went back to the drawing board, and this is just to give the board a little bit of, you know, we certainly took your comments to absolute heart. We, we uh, chopped two units off the density component that we requested, which forced us to obviously still continue with the amount of COA units. So what's, what's happening is, is the fact that we're reducing the units is not changing our COA count, which means that the density that we're trying to retain is a balance of retaining um, 
a number of units that makes the project viable and also provides for the COA uh, component. The combination of the third uh, bedroom unit, the three bedroom unit on the first floor is to retain some uh, function and form to be able to provide that while having this co-op workspace kind of scenario. So a lot of people obviously are in work from home uh, scenarios as they are, you have you know studio units, one bedroom units, two bedroom units, you have a mix of units. The idea in theory would be is, is to have those people that say, hey, you know what, I don't wanna use my one bedroom to also work from it, or you know maybe there's just too much noise, or my wife is also working from home right now. I'd love to rent this unit in the building. So I have, I'm already there. I walk downstairs, I leave my work at my work. I kind of do my telecommuting. If I had to meet with somebody, fantastic, they could swing by. And that was the concept and idea behind what we're pushing along with the fact that there's obviously a lot of other density projects being built in and around the area, specifically at King's, at the movie theater, and obviously at Spatz's, those units um, and those people potentially needing a similar use. And that's who we would be marketing that to, to obviously have this concept in theory where people could walk over, use the building, they could walk around, go to Dunkin' Donuts. It becomes a nexus and a kind of a continuity. So before we ever were to market this project at large to anyone, the concept in theory would be to market it directly to the people in the building first to use those units accordingly and then go to the larger scale of the projects around and then finally kind of to the open market scenario. So that was the kind of the, the, the mixture that we had. And obviously there comes a point in any project, a tipping point where, you know, the cost of construction and the units that need to be brought into, into the, the the equation start to reach a balance where it doesn't become very functional. I think in the big scheme of things in this particular project, while I note the board's um, issue with density, I, I think Mr. Toby will get into those calculations and components, but specifically as we've now reduced our numbers, um, I've always looked at density as a function of parking in many respects and, and the way that we kind of comply with parking in, in all really in almost all aspects, we've changed a little bit. We need a little bit of relief, but the reality of it is, is that this is not one of those circumstances where, you know, we also, we deal with this all the time with this board and obviously with the planning board as well, where we have scenarios where you can park eight people on site, but you really need 13 or 14. And that's a, that's a tricky thing. So we have these uses that get approved for restaurants or other things. And they constantly end up back before the zoning board at every turn and iteration of tenancy because of the nature of the parking. That's not this building. So we have this ugly parking garage that's gonna be capped with this beautiful building that sits in and around it. And it forms a lot of different functions. So when we looked at it, we tried to say, we hear the board and we tried to, we, so we dropped the units and the shift of having this mix downstairs was this kind of combination to provide the commercial space along with trying to meet our COA obligations and trying to meet the density. So we're trying to adjust all of the different angles of this to try and come to obviously a better project and also to you know meet some of our goals and, and obviously meet the board's goals. So I think that's kind of a you know an overall synopsis, but um, that's kind of where we were coming from. And, and we certainly did hear you, which is why we did chop the units that we did. So to that end, I guess we could turn it over to kind of Mr. Toby and Mr. Hughes and, or Mr. maybe Mr. Hughes about how he feels about some of the density in our changes. Well, why don't we, do we want to talk about, I think we're going to spend a fair amount of time with the planners, the engineering. The, sure. So why don't we engage Mr. Hollows and Mr. Salfaro for a couple of minutes for any tweaks to what we discussed since this application was born this in 2020 with the planning board and went through all of the engineering testimony and decorative lamps and pavers, et cetera, landscaping plans. So why don't we just spend, you know, five or so minutes with uh, Mr. Hollows and Mr. Salfaro, and then maybe we can dismiss those two professionals Perfect. earlier, if that's okay with you, Mr. Santori. Absolutely. And I also um, want to, I want to be very fair and I want to provide additional time for Mr. Tobia and Mr. Keenan Hughes to collect their thoughts as well. Thank you. So Mr. Hollows, you um, obviously you were sworn in at the last hearing and um, Mr. Sullivan, are you okay to just remind him that he's still under oath or do you want to re-swear him in or? Um, he's still under oath, so he's good. Yep. Okay, so Mr. Hollows, can you please just take us through some of the concerns the board had relative to the screening, the parking, any kind of configurations, placements of new information so that we can just kind of run through the changes for the board? 
sorry, on um, sheet three, which is um, the grading plan, site plan, shows most of the detail that we're proposing. Um, I've added notes regarding the planning board approval for the sidewalk and the, uh, the lighting along Springfield Avenue. And that, that's that red line across the front. That's going to be the new sidewalk to match up with the, uh, the township's requirement. We added a loading space. Um, it's in the driveway adjacent to the building. We've defined the trash enclosure, and that's that gray area behind the building. And there's a detail of the fencing and concrete slab on sheet four. Um, we also added a rack for the heating and air conditioning units that would sit behind the building where the jog is. And along the driveway, there were some lights. They're, they're not functioning now, but we are proposing to put a wall pack type light along the driveway where the other lights were. Um, it'd be an LED fixture. It, the detail of it is on sheet four. And then also that same fixture would sit above the um, openings to the parking deck for the lower deck and the upper deck. To the rear of the driveway, where we had the uh, snow removal area, we've added the drywells that are required for the additional impervious cover coverage, and that's two drywells. There's also a small yard drain in that area. Um, we talked about possible melting of snow, so that yard drain would capture the water and carry it down to the trench drain and into the existing storm drainage system on site. Right. And we're also um, designating that area for two parking stalls. One would be a standard stall, one would be a compact stall. Um, we figure that re realistically, those stalls, especially, the, well, last year, they could have been used all year long because we really didn't have a snow event. But realistically, probably, there may be 30 days out of the year where you, you may not be able to park a car there. And if it, if it got longer, we could actually clean it out um, with a backhoe and, and truck the snow off. And just quickly for the record, uh, Mr. Sullivan, I just want to add, I had an opportunity to speak to my client and he indicated that in the event that um, the board was okay with these parking spaces, it would not be an issue for him to, as a condition of any um, resolution, to remove the snow if it were to build up in those areas and cart it off site. Thank you, yes. And we also added some additional landscaping by that uh, snow removal area in our back left corner, so a couple of arborvita back there. And on the uh, opposite side of the, the property, we've added, I believe it's 16 arborvita to fill in in the spaces between the existing trees. And then we also added some to screen the, uh, the air conditioner uh, heat pump rack that sits there. And that's really the, um, the changes that we made. I think those are things that we talked about at the last meeting. Uh, we wanted some additional screening. We wanted a little bit more detail on the stormwater management. We wanted detail on the trash enclosure and in a, in a loading space. I think that's really the thing, and then some lighting. I think those the things we talked about, and these are the changes that we made to the plan. Great. Mr. Hollis, just a quick point of clarification. You indicated that you thought there were 16 um, trees being proposed along that sideline, but the I think it's 16 total trees, 13 on that side, and uh, three on the on the side where by the uh, two additional parking spaces. Is that correct? I, I, I believe you're correct. Okay. Just want to clarify for the record. Thank you. That's really what I have. If Mr. Silfaro has some comments on that, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Mr. Silfaro, do you have any comments? And I believe that you are still under oath as well. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have any comments other than uh, I appreciate you revising the plans like we discussed at the last hearing. Um, obviously, our project was to move forward and, and be approved. Uh, we would still comply with the conditions contained in my September 22nd, 2020 letter. Is that correct? That would be correct. Okay. Um, are you going to discuss the parking variance tonight or is that going to be left to the planner? I believe that will be left to the planner. I've just outlined, um, I mean, I can tell you what on the 
On the lower parking deck, there's 14, 14 parking stalls. The upper parking deck, there's 20 stalls. And then the two stalls that, um, that we have in the snow removal area. That gives us 36 and we need 37 based on the new configuration of the first floor, the proposed configuration of the first floor. So we're seeking a variance for, that, for one stall at this point. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Solfaro, thank you very much. Mr. Hollows, thank you very much. Mr. Santori, I'm okay with dismissing the engineers for the evening if you're okay, if you don't think there'll be any additional testimony needed from those two professionals. I think that other than the parking, which um, you know we certainly collectively between Mr. Toby and Mr. Hughes, I don't think there's any issue in terms of calculations or tabulations on that. I think we have a firm grasp, so um, I have no issue with that. Okay. At this point, I think it's appropriate for the planners to have a discussion, but I just want to reiterate th the board seemed unanimous with the commercial on the ground floor and really not engaging in the habitable uh, ground floor. But with that said, absolutely, Mr. Tobia has the floor, followed by Mr. Keenan for some comments, but Again, I don't want to spend too much time on something. I think we should really hit point one, which is the reasoning for the grounds floor and see how much further we go. So uh, am I okay on audio, folks? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us again, Mr. Tobia. Welcome back. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Always appreciate it. Um, first of all, I want to uh, uh, mark this exhibit. if. Ms. Wolf is still in the room. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a new PowerPoint uh, data today. You'll see it has 21 sheets in it. Uh, we're gonna go through some of those uh, tonight, but I believe we're up to A4. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, I have exhibit A4 as being a colorized site plan sheet three. So maybe we're up to A5. Perfect. Sorry. And you'll send the board a digital copy if you haven't already. We did that last time, the, the day after the meeting. We'll do it again uh, tomorrow, okay? Perfect, thank you. Um, so on, your, uh, on my screen share now, board members, you should be seeing slide 14. Is everyone seeing that? It's cut off a little bit on my screen. Uh, it's called proposed ground and second floors. And in the lower right, you should now see the slide number. No. No? We're seeing the, the, the survey at the moment. How about that? Uh-huh. Okay. okay. Now, so now you're seeing a uh, proposed ground and second floors? Correct. Yep. Okay. I'm working off of two monitors here, so I get confused sometimes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and board members, we heard what you said about the ground floor. We do want to just give you the basics on this, okay? So you can really make an informed decision, understand what we're talking about with residential use on the ground floor, and then I'll go into remarks on density. Uh, and on these two narrow topics, I think if I take 15 minutes, it'll be a lot. Um, if you look at slide 14 uh, on the lower uh, exhibit, this is the ground floor plan. I'm now circling it. Mr. Hollows before mentioned uh, the deck in the back will have 14 stalls in it. To the right of this exhibit is on Springfield Avenue. And you'll see along the lower edge of it is the existing and proposed driveway. The plan last meeting uh, had three units on the ground floor and no commercial whatsoever. We heard your input at that point uh, during a straw poll and we reacted. Um, we have now sketched for you with our architect's work, Nancy Doherty, um, a proposal that would put, if you follow my pointer, uh, 1,647 square feet on the ground floor. I think we had nine office suites shown 
This would be toward the front of the building. Um, and then we did propose one single unit at the rear of the building, which we felt would have the least amount of utility for any kind of commercial or uh, retail space. All the other units would be on the upper floors. All the other units in terms of housing would be permitted by the DD zoning, which permits apartments up, okay? Um, I don't want to reiterate all the points we made about how this building has struggled over the years, but it has clearly struggled to attract retail. Even the office use on the ground floor has been sporadic over the um, um, nearly three decades since the building went up. The pitch to you is to allow us to do this one unit on the ground floor. It would be an affordable unit. It would be an inherently, fish, uh, uh, inherently beneficial land use. Um, and we think it would take place in such a way that it would not compromise commercial use of the front of the building. Commercial use of the front of the building could indeed take place in one of two ways. Any type of retail sale or service use um, of the ground floor is permitted by zoning. Nothing like that has ever gone into the building, to the best of my recollection. Um, and then the 1995 zoning board uh, approval on this case also permitted office uses. Both could go into this space. Okay, so that's the background um, on the use. Um, and Mr. Chairman, we yeah. heard what you said. We're not trying to argue with you. We are trying to tell you that we think this is a nice balance. In fact, what you see now proposed has 59% of the ground floor in commercial use. Okay, with the balance being that apartment and a little storage unit on the ground floor. That's the background on that. I'll pause for a moment on that and then um, talk to you uh, a little bit about density. Um, this zone permits um, 20 units the acre. Um, right now, what's being proposed is, is 30.5 units per acre. When we saw you back on September 24th, we were at 34 and a half. So we've come down four units per acre by eliminating those two uh, units formally on the ground floor. And everything on the upper floors, by the way, stays the same, which means um, we had eight units approved in the existing building and we're proposing eight over the existing parking deck, okay? The 30.5 units per acre um, include- By the way, how many units are you proposing total? 17. Okay, and it was 19. It was 19, the last time we saw you. So we've shaved it by two. Um, and as I said, the new density now proposed is 30 and a half the acre. Um, within the 17 proposed units are five studio apartments, okay? These are smaller units. And just for clarification, you are allowed how many in this? If I recall, it's 11. That's correct. That was the chairman asked me that last month, right? We did the calculation. Eleven are permitted in terms of an absolute number. Okay. Um, five of the seventeen proposed units are studios, so they still get counted in density, but they're um, smaller units. I've always considered a studio essentially the equivalent of a, a half of a two-bedroom unit. Um, so they do skew the density upward. Um, I'm persuaded um, that this density is comparable to recently uh, approved and settled affordable housing sites in your community. Right across the street at the King Shopping Center um, is what your, your housing element calls the Stratton House, which has been approved at 31 units per acre, almost exactly what's proposed now by uh, the applicant. Uh, the Lone Pine Drive application also more or less right across the street is approved at 31 units the acre, okay? 
these densities in the center of uh, the business district are appropriate densities uh, for a business district. And we want to remind you one of the most important things you can do as you rebuild your business district and revitalize it is to add housing to the district. Housing supports businesses, businesses support housing. Um, some of us in this world call it the walking wallet, okay, which means every apartment tenant here can come out of his or her apartment and walk to every store, every store along your strip, um, whether it's a supermarket, a bank, a pharmacy, um, and not need your car. For my clarification, you, you're mentioning two other projects, correct? Either of those projects have first floor residential space? No, the only one that I can think of um, that does, I guess, would be the front half of the movie theater site. Also, right, you know, more or less right across the street, um, which has retail behind it, but not up on the street. Um, that incidentally is a density of 19 units the acre. But it had, but none of them have residential on ground floor. I don't think so. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yep. And you know, and remember now, we don't either. Okay. No, so well, you, you do if you're proposing it, right? You're 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 comparing density to other properties, but we're not comparing them fully. So I just want to make sure that we are, right? Those are we're comparing equal densities, but they don't have none of them have been proposed for residential ground floor, all commercial. Right. And what we have now, as I said, is 58.9% ground floor commercial. Okay. Uh, so the front of the building um, will look just like it does now, function probably as office space. Um, and let me go through what Augie said before, and I think there was a question on parking. Um, we believe the density uh, proposed, um, first of all, there are a couple important indicators about the adequacy of the density. One, we're okay on height, and we're not asking for height variance. And two, parking as a, a critical indicator of whether you have too much housing on a site or not, um, we believe uh, we're okay on. Although we're one stall short, we're at 37 required, 36 proposed. The 36 layout on slide 14 uh, with the upper floor plan shown at the top of this slide with 20 stalls up. On the bottom of the slide, the lower deck, 14 stalls on the lower deck and the two stalls in the back northwest corner of the site. Since our applicant is stipulating to carrying snow off if needed from this snow removal area that doubles as the two parking stalls, we want you to consider this as a 36 stall parking lot with only 37 stalls uh, proposed. Since the last meeting, uh, we did a little work on how to manage parking, okay? And we figured out a way to reserve at least one parking space for every unit, numbered and reserved by lease on the top deck. 17 of the 20 stalls would therefore be reserved by lease for each unit. That would leave three surplus stalls uh, to float, whether they're for visitors or for people who happen to ask for more than one parking stall for the unit. On the ground floor, we have calculated if the office space at the front of the building went office, what we call non-professional office, six stalls would be required by code. We would reserve six stalls on the lower deck. All others would float and would be available uh, for both commercial tenants and residential tenants. Uh, the applicant will seek commercial tenants in the building who will uh, use the building primarily during business hours. Monday to Friday, nine to six, something like that. Um, 
and uh, consequently leave nearly every space in a deck and in the back corner of the site for residential use during the evening and uh, during weekends. Um, we want you to recognize because of the train station, because of walkability to all your stores and shops, and because of the use of some units here, especially the um, um, studios that may not even have households with cars, that we think this parking plan is abundant. We will not rely on on-street parking or overflow parking on other sites. It is an indicator that the density proposed, although we need a variance for it, is, uh, is adequate. Okay. Now, Mr. Chairman, um, you asked me to talk about two particular topics. I did. We do have other things to talk about on this, but um, I want to throw it back to you for questions and, and to hear from uh, the town planner on these two limited items, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Tobia. Um, I'd like to pass it off to Mr. Hughes uh, for his planning testimony. And uh, if you have any ideas or input regarding the ground floor, Mr. Hughes. Certainly, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I really see my role as, you know, usually it's one of simply helping the board in its deliberations, evaluating the project, answering questions, interpreting the ordinance. Uh, I normally don't provide, you know, a firm opinion um, on these issues. However, in this case, I, I do have a strong opinion, at least as it relates to the use issue. Um, and I did set forth some of that in my letter, but as it relates to the ground floor of, of this particular building in, you know, keeping in mind what the intent of the ordinance is, which is in the downtown, you want to have an active ground floor. You know, you want to encourage that activity, the pedestrian oriented environment, all of that. Here we have a building that it's just not set up for retail. Um, I think that's been well established over the years. We do have the prior grant of the variance permitting office use in this location, but just physically, retail doesn't work here. It's, it's uh, separated by grade from the sidewalk. It's set back. It doesn't have traditional retail storefronts. So in my opinion, retail is, is not the answer. And, and certainly mandating retail here would be problematic, I think, um, in the longer term, just running risks of a long-term vacancy. With respect to the office use, um, I think that's more appropriate for this particular building. Um, obviously, that's what it was originally set up for. Um, I, I do want to, well, perhaps get some clarification from the applicant, but what I'm understanding is that they would like some flexibility around the office use, which is that you know, if they can find a single tenant to take this space, that would be terrific. If not, you know, in my opinion, what I've been seeing recently is the concept of doing, even at this very small scale, shared individual office space. Um, we're starting to see a lot of demand for that, particularly coming out of the pandemic, where we're likely to see more of a hybrid uh, workplace environment moving forward. I do think there will be demand within Berkeley Heights, especially given all the multifamily development that's gonna be occurring for places to work outside of your home. And I think this is potentially an opportunity to do that. Um, if, if the applicant would like to have that as an option, I only raise it because I think it does pose a few um, interesting you know, challenges from a planning standpoint or, or a little bit of a different wrinkle than if you had just a single tenant, right? Which is that you have to have someone that's going to manage the space. When you have nine different individual office tenants, you don't want to have a situation where each and every one of them has their own business or they're having clients coming um, on a regular basis throughout the day. That obviously has ramifications from a parking standpoint. So, um, if in fact the applicant would like to, to have, have that as an option, if the board were to agree to that, those are some of the issues you may wanna consider addressing, you know, as, as part of 
um, any deliberation on that use. As for the residential, I think this ties back to what the intent of the ordinance is, which again was to create that active ground floor. What we have here is a unique situation where they're accommodating a residential unit, a three bedroom residential unit, which is only being provided as it relates to affordable housing compliance. They're providing that behind the commercial space. So it's not something that's even gonna be visible or known that it's there, at least from the public realm. So I think um, it can be distinguished from a situation where they're, as they were before, requesting residential literally, you know, right up uh, within the, the front facade of the building. So I think the affordable housing aspect of it has to be considered because um, this is a set aside that could go towards fulfilling the township's future affordable housing obligations. It was not anticipated um, as part of the most recent settlement. So this is uh, these are additional units that can help the township moving forward. So that that does have to be considered. I Mr. Keenan, real part quick question. That, that, that unit on the ground floor, on the first floor, without that unit, they'd still have to have the same amount of affordable housing with or without that unit, correct? They still would need to figure out where to accommodate a three bedroom unit. That's correct. So um, the, the, the unit in and of itself is again, more beneficial to them to be able to find the spot. It's not that it provides an extra one because without that three bedroom unit, they still have to have the same amount of affordable housing locations or spaces. Um, yeah, I haven't done the math on that. I think they would still have a three unit set aside which would have to include a three bedroom unit. Um, and then as for the, the density aspect, you know, I think Mr. Tobia's analysis basically touched on this, but the standard is really, can the property accommodate any problems associated with the proposed deviation from the township's density standards? And, um, you know, the things that the board should consider are impacts like visual impacts, um, certainly parking supply, um, and in that regard, in my opinion, I think the way this building is set up, um, it's probably going to attract quite a number of single person households and um, many one car households. They have five studio units. Um, so I think on average having at least, well, certainly one space per unit and if needed, they have the ability to provide for a second car. It appears there's sufficient parking uh, for, for the residential component. Um, you know, other considerations would be environmental, which really goes back to Mr. Solfaro's analysis on drainage and other things. I think we've resolved many of those issues. Um, and it's really just, you know, is this a case of overdevelopment from a density standpoint? Um, I haven't done the density calculations on the other redevelopment projects in town. I mean, I will say, you know, Stratton House, which um, has not it, it does have a, a designated or adopted redevelopment plan um, or not yet, it's a proposed redevelopment plan, but that actually does have a uh, ground floor residential. I mean, that's off of Springfield Avenue. It's a different context, um, but just to clarify, that does have uh, residential within the first story of that proposed building, um, as well as Mill Creek, which is down on Lone Pine Drive. Um, so, with respect to density, it's really, you know, do you feel that from an impact standpoint, this proposed density can be accommodated on the site, all things considered? Um, so with that, uh, you know, I think that that sort of sums up my comments, at least on the use and the, the density issues. And I'm happy to take any questions from the board. Um, can you, Mr. Hughes, can you just I'm just looking at the ground floor. You've got the, the three bedroom unit is, a, is just over a thousand square feet and the six and the commercial it, right now as it stands is about 1650. Can you again explain what a potential vision is of this like co-op shared commercial space concept is again? Yeah, sure. I mean, what I've seen um at least one other application I've been involved with recently is, um, you know, an office space like this frees up. And I think as everyone is aware, it's 
it's a challenging environment out there, uh, particularly in the suburbs, trying to find office tenants to take these spaces in, in many cases. And obviously here we have a lot of history with this building that, that sort of backs that up. So instead of chasing a single tenant and knowing that there's this growing demand for individual office space users, what I've seen is that there's, there's basically, it could be the same property manager handling the, the residential then handles the office space. And these individual offices are leased out on even a month to month basis. And those individual tenants have the benefit of the common amenities that may be there, a kitchenette, a meeting room. Um, you know, it's really intended for folks that, you know, they're either tired of working at home, they, they want a place outside the home, they don't have space at home. Um, it could even be uh, you know, a larger business somewhere, knowing that, you know, they have a few folks that live in the area and would like a, a, an office outside of the house, you know, could lease that on, on behalf of their employees. So it's just a more flexible work model. It's not one of these, it's not a larger scale, you've heard of WeWork, that kind of thing, but it's really, it's sort of adapting that same model on a very small scale. Um, but again, I think it does, it does require uh, you know, a well-managed, well-maintained property to, to make that work. So would the property owner be the landlord and lease out individual office space in a common setting? Or does someone else, could I reserve the entire front of that building and then lease it out to the, the people of my choosing? I think it could go either way. And that's why I'm sort of, you know, probing at this a little bit, because I want the board to kind of pin down, you know, if we want to leave this open as an option, there's some wrinkles here. So I think it could be either way. I, I can help clarify a little bit. So I think for starters, um, addressing the, the latter of the comments, it is not our intention to lease to sublease. That's not at all the goal, <coughs> goal to maintain and manage and rent out these spaces accordingly, whether it be one office to a person or a series of persons, or, you know, maybe a group of offices to, you know, two or three people. We recognize very simply this, and I think it's an important component. If that concept were not um, obviously being digested by the market for any reason, which we really don't believe that's going to be the case, and we ended up with a single tenancy scenario, and that single tenancy scenario um, would have to go through the standard parking analysis and submit that for Mr. Baco for site plan purposes. And if there was an issue, then that they would be back before this board. So we're, we're not looking to sidestep anything or do anything. Um, the idea and concept was to try and find something that was going to collaboratively work in the parking confines to help continue to keep, um, you know, there's a lot of parking at this site. It's probably one of the better park sites in the town relative to that. Uh, scenario, but I think that was really our concern. So Mr. Forst and Mr. Galasso, as the owners of this particular property, being long-term invested uh, members of the community, plan to actively manage this, this business and building. Um, so that's really the goal at this point in time. Um, just to, to that point, can you tell me what change, if you can, Mr. Santori, or, or if Mr. Forrest is on the line, what changed from the planning board approval 10 months ago? You know, we, we had a concept with eight units on the upper floors and some type of commercial downstairs, and it was seemed to be a home run in January. And what happened eight months later? Actually, um, realistically, yep. the it was really just a bifurcated element. It wasn't really, we never represented that we were gonna be continuing with anything on the first floor one way or another. We, we just, at that point in time, obviously that's what it was approved for. We never really addressed the first floor because we couldn't address the first floor with the um, planning board because obviously that anything that we would be doing relative to possible units of conversion um, would have to be done before the zoning board from a use perspective on the ground floor. But secondarily, and apart from that, this building has been advertised for rent from the time my client um, purchased it. And as a result of that, uh, there's been, you know, the thing's been actively, from the time he was under contract to the time he closed it till now, there's been no, it's it had the Weikert sign's been up there and there's, there's just no, 
there's no tenants and it's over a year now since we've been, since we started. And I think that's as, as it worn, had worn in, keep in mind, we started the process in August of 19 when we started to go under contract. We closed it in November of 19. Mm-hmm. And then we went to the zoning, uh, the planning board in February of 20. Okay. So as, as time continued to wane and it just, it just wasn't happening. And then we switched gears to try and say, okay, let's go with a full blown concept here to get the best utility of this business of, of this uh, site. And obviously covering the parking deck um, was a function of an, of, you know, an expansion of, of some of the density and right. it had its, it, it, there was a variety of issues to try and, you know, see if this could be something that would uh, work out well, so. Okay. And can you tell me a little, where did the solar panels come from? When was that born? Um, so the solar panels in response to the Environmental Commission's um, request to address, um, you know, possibly put solar panels on this. So we had thought that it's a positive element that the board might be seeking. And the way that this has been working, I recently just did one and it's a very odd process uh, before the planning board. The planning board didn't even know why we were there because technically any roof mounted solar requires uh, planning board approval. There's a site plan waiver process, but you can't do site plan waiver because the cost of the improvement exceeds $10,000. So therefore it triggers right. yep. A, yep. You know, a requirement to get before the planning yeah, board. $10,000 or a thousand square feet, something like that, right? Yeah, so I mean, we couldn't comply with that in that instance, but in, in, in same in this scenario. So what I had said was, if we're going to do it, let's, and, and, the, board, and the environmental commission wants it, as an additional um, improvement to this particular structure, we would be happy to do it. And we knew we needed to do it now. Otherwise we ran the risk of going, having to come back before the planning board on a separate occasion. And to be honest, um, that application for my client, which we have to discuss with the town, it was a $25,000 application to put roof mounted solar uh, um, on, right. on a building. And it's just not a process. That, and that's not a thing to any improvements. That was the cost of the, of the process. And that can't happen. So that's why I wanted to make sure we put it on here at, at this point in time. Okay. Um, questions? You know what, let me, let's, let's open it up to any members of the public at this point. Since Mr. Hughes has had an opportunity and Mr. Tobia, I just like to have uh, co- any comments from the public. Can I get a motion to open up the meeting to members of the public, Mr. Coviello? I'll make a motion. We have a motion by Mr. Coviello and a second by Mr. Ringwood, please. Seconded. Thank you. So we have the meeting is open to members of the public that have a question or comment regarding the testimony that's been provided thus far. And Mr. Coviello, can you please pan the room? Certainly. So any members of the public, uh, virtual or physical hand, or mention us in the chat, we will remove you from mute. Currently, everybody that has video is off mute. There are a handful of folks not video on mute. There are no, I can unmute everyone, Mr. Chairman, and give them. Yeah, why don't we try that? Because I just want uh, anyone heard. I don't want to miss anyone if there is any public interest. All right. All participants have been given the ability to unmute themselves. Again, all participants have the ability to unmute themselves at this time. Again, Mr. Chairman, seeing no one virtually raising their hand or taking themselves off mute when everybody has the ability to do so. So we we are hearing no one? I am hearing and seeing no one. Okay. Um... With that said, can I get a motion to close the, well, you know what, we'll close it now, but we we may reopen it again with some additional testimony. So I just wanted to give folks the opportunity to question the the planners. I'll make a motion to close to meeting uh, members of the public at this moment. Thank you. And a second. 
I second that. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was Mr. Sylvester. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Tobia and Mr. Keenan, thank you very much for your testimony. And I, I do appreciate the comments regarding the, the units on the, on the first floor and some of the density. Um, at this point, you know, we, we took an initial straw poll. I'm going to share my comment regarding the ground floor. I like uh, the hybrid uh, combination. I, I think retail is not going to work. Commercial on the front of the building facing Springfield Avenue in some kind of co-op concept may work where you have, you know, you know the, the accountant, the financial professional and, and, and another professional there sharing some kind of office space on a rotational basis with maybe a common kitchen and a conference room, much like, you know, uh, the law practice, Mr. Santor, you have four lawyers in the office, each, each lawyer has the office and you have, you've got the common room to take care of business. That concept kind of works. Regarding Mr. Keenan's comment about and Mr. Tobias' comment about the affordable three-bedroom unit in the rear. Um, I, I can see the merits in the spirit of co-compliance, an opportunity for another unit that's not fronting. You know, it's in the back of the building, which again, there was a comment made is it's not as visible as it is for ground floor. So. Um, I've buckled a little bit and I can understand the concept for the three bedroom. So I would be in favor of the one unit in on the ground floor, provided that the commercial element was in the front fronting Springfield Avenue. I still have a concern regarding the totality of the units which we'll speak about next, but I just wanna run past uh, Mr. Coviello if you had a comment and I wanna go through members of the board because I think it's appropriate for the design team to know where we are. Mr. Coviello. No, I, I would, I wanna, I don't like the first floor element, but I'm again, willing to give if we can give somewhere else, right? So again, my two sticking points were ground floor residential as well as some density. If I'm okay with the commercial on the ground floor, as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be retail for me. Retail doesn't work there. I didn't wanna force it on them. Uh, if we're going to allow some give on the residential on the first floor, I'd like to see some give on the density, maybe on floors two and three uh, for a balance. I know that we've compared density to other locations. I'd rather keep this one on the merits of its own project. Uh, so again, I'd like to hear it from other board members, but again, if we're gonna give a little, I, I wanna see a little. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cyber. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I, I like what you guys have come up with and what you've done. Um, I retail. No, I said I said commercial to begin with at the beginning, whether you know, be office space for attorneys or um, accountants or whatever. And I'm OK with the um, low income housing in the back. I don't I think it's a, a decent compromise, but I'm also concerned about the overall density of what's going on. And I said, originally, I think the planning board was 11 at one point. And I think you're looking at 17 now, and I'm just going to throw a number out of 13. That's yeah. be a happy medium with I, all of this. I, I agree with that number, Dave. Yeah. I see a one, four, four, four for a total of 13. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Ringwood, please. Yeah, just to, to reiterate what I think everybody's saying, I, I don't think any of us believe that retail is going to work on the first floor. So I, I think the the office space in the front is is a good solution. And, and I think it shows a nice effort by you guys to come to us with that, knowing our concerns. Um, I don't know what the right density number is at this point in time, but I, I so I'm okay with the first floor, the way it's drawn on the new plans. I do have concerns about the density. Mr. D'Elia? Um, just, just one point back to the first floor, that one unit. Um, the, the office space, if you force in 
to go to office space on the first floor. We, we talked about the amount of vacant retail. A lot of the vacant retail is only getting filled with office use. So if, if we keep pushing more office space, then you, you might be getting into a problem where then there's gonna be an overflow of office space. So I'm okay with the, the one unit on the first floor um, and then the rest office space, uh, not forcing the retail. Um, as far as the density, um, he did shave it down a little. Um, if it can come down a little more, um, I think that'd be great. I think cutting it down to 13 is, is pushing a little beam the density in some of these other projects is close to what this is. Can you can you say that one more time? Just that I'm okay with the the one unit on the first yeah. floor. And the density, if we can bring it down maybe one, maybe two more units, I, I think that's getting more in the ballpark where I feel comfortable. Okay. Mr. Sylvester? Uh, um, I like what Mike said, uh, the exchange. I'd like to get it down to 13 for density. Uh, I have to say, I'm not familiar enough with the co-op uh, you were discussing. I, I, I just don't see that. I, I, I let me restate that. I can see that being on a occupied for a long time because there's 18 unoccupied retail uh, or commercial units on Springfield Avenue right now. So you, you would, uh, to clarify, you would be in support of the COA unit in the back, but you're you are sensitive to the, the commercial element in the front because of the number of vacancies that already exist in the downtown and HB zones. Is that correct? Okay. Great. Mr. Pareda? Uh, yeah, I'm in agreement with the majority of the board uh, regarding uh, the new proposal. I like, uh, you know, that flex idea, the flex commercial space idea, as well as uh, that. Uh, you know, low income unit on the first floor. I think it's a good compromise. Uh, again, uh, I'm in favor uh, and alignment with Mr. Delia as far as the uh, the density. I think 13 probably a little too low. You know, I would I was thinking personally maybe in the 15. Uh, and the only reason I go back to the concern about the parking situation. I don't want to get into a situation where we have a line of cars parked on the main driveway because there's no parking spots. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe around 15 for density, but uh, those are my thoughts at this time. And Bob Delia, was that your area as well? Yeah, I'd be very comfortable if we went down to 15. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nappy. Yeah, no, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that the, we were able to reduce it from 34 and a half, I think, down to 30 or so. Um, I think that's a, a great change. I appreciate that. And as far as the COA unit, um, as long as it's in the rear on the ground level and we still have commercial in the front, uh, I, uh, I would be okay with that as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we Mr. 17, that's less than any other, the other two projects Michael mentioned. <laughs> who, who was that? I'm sorry, we missed. Who, whose comment was that? Maybe the, maybe the audience members are still unmuted. Uh, Mr. Santori, you've, you've heard some comments. Did you want to spend some time a five, take a five minute break and chat with your client about how the board feels. It looks like the COA unit on the ground floor may be working and some type of number less than 17 
somewhere between 13 and 15 might be a reasonable number that the board can digest. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Just give me uh, two minutes. Um, why, don't, why, don't, why don't we make it five? It's 918. So at 9, 925, wh why don't we take a pause? If you want to chat with your team offline for a couple of minutes, and then we will continue our dialogue. And if there's any additional comments that your uh, professionals would like to make, we are absolutely welcome to listen to them. And we will reopen again to members of the public should there be another public comment, okay? Great, thank you. Right, folks, we're gonna take five minutes. Thank you very much.
We're ready. And before we get started, I just uh, have a question. Maybe uh, this is for Keenan or. Um, let's just make sure we have everyone back. Uh, I just want to make sure Mr. Santori's team is intact. And it looks like we have everyone on our side and Regina are you okay we're recording yes okay so we're back and then uh Mr. Coviello you had a clarification question I did so uh, the way we calculate affordable housing is 15 percent of units is that correct for for rental so units for rent, have, rental units are 15 15 percent of the number of rental units so yep. if you had 10 units it'd be 1.5 or, or two affordable housing units, correct? If you had, I'm sorry, if you had how many? So if we have 10 units, you would have 1.5 from the calculation right. and you'd round up to two units. Right. So in this case, if the number 15 has been thrown around a lot, if 15 were the number at 15%, we'd be at 2.25. Would that round up or down to two to three? I believe you still round up. Um, I, there I may think be anything some... over you round up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Santori, I mean, yes. I'm asking, not telling. Oh I'm no, sure. No, I, I was waiting for the. So, so the answer to the question is, is that um, it's our belief that based upon those calculations, we would need to provide three units. Okay. I just it was more of just knowledge for myself. Thank yeah, you. No, not a problem. So I did have an opportunity, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Did you want me to continue? Or... Yes. No. Please, absolutely. Okay. Please. So I did have an opportunity to consult with my client. And um, also discuss, uh, we had Mr. Toby on the line just to go through a few things. And we certainly appreciate everything that the board has indicated and said. And I, I guess I just wanna go back on a, on a couple things. Sure. So my client is prepared to cut the um, request in the back building from the eight current units to seven units. The seven units would be configured as six two bedrooms and one, one bedroom of which two of those units would be COA units. Okay. Um, the, it, I think it's important for the board to understand uh, something a little bit from our end, obviously. So as we come down, that would be three units from where we originally proposed. Obviously the economics become into play and part of the whole concept idea, theory and appearance aesthetically is to cover the garage. Covering the garage, once that's covered, creates a certain amount of area inside obviously footprint that needs to be finished. And whether they're finished with studios or two bedrooms or whatever the case is, by increasing the two bedroom count, we're obviously dropping the unit and we're also bringing the parking into compliance. 
Mm -hmm. the and I do appreciate you know some of the board members indicating that you know 13 might have been too much of a uh, you know of a reduction it, and obviously it's it's an untenable project at 13 and even at 15 16 is kind of the breaking point um, for us because keeping in mind that we're providing two more COA units in that area as well as well as obviously trying to finish and cap the entire deck so as we talk about these units being, um, you know, two bedrooms, mostly two bedrooms at this point in time, the, the issue with that is the units obviously are going to be very large units to start with, which are, you know, it's accommodating, but we're also trying to keep the price points in an affordable range with obviously a lot of units coming online as well in and around the area. So we want to make sure we have a sensible um, pattern. And I think Mr. Tobia can speak intelligently on his experience as it pertains to three bedroom units and how they kind of play in the marketplace. Cause I know Michael does a lot of this work and Michael, if you could just give the board some edification on these larger units and how they, what you're seeing. So, okay. Just in a couple of minutes, um, what the marketplace um, is doing now, we're talking about market units, not affordables is uh, almost entirely divided all between one and two bedroom units. Okay. The only threes we are seeing are in the world of affordable housing because they're required by statute. This applicant has become a bit innovative by seeking studios to attract the millennial demographic. Okay. Now, with that said, um, larger one bedroom units and larger one two bedroom units are in demand. And we're seeing that a lot where, where I'm doing a lot of work from basically Morristown to Milburn, um, that not everyone wants a 750 square foot apartment. So if we reduce that back addition by one unit and make the other units correspondingly bigger, there's no doubt there will be market demand for slightly bigger units. Thank you, Michael. And I think, you know, for the board's edification, the plan that we had submitted showed five two bedroom units, one studio and, um, Two, two uh, one bedroom units, I believe is where we were. The, the crux of this is now to make it six two bedroom and one one bedroom of which the six two bedroom, and I think this is a question for Mr. Hughes, but I think that you know in full transparency, the way we understand it based upon this 33% allocation, we're compelled to not provide a one bedroom COA unit but we were compelled to provide two two-bedroom COA units. Is that correct, Mr. Hughes? Well, based on the UHAC breakdown, you can't provide more than 20% of bedrooms. So right. That's what works. Right. right, and as a result of that, we're at 33%, and therefore we have to have two two-bedrooms and one three-bedroom. So I think that that additional onus upon us is something that I think the board hopefully will take someone into consideration as well, in developing this space, recognizing the fact that we are not providing a one bedroom COA, we're providing two two bedrooms along with the one three. So the back building already is going to be two two bedrooms um, that are gonna be for COA purposes. There'll be four market two bedrooms and one one bedroom. The units obviously will all be of good size and uh, ample you know, closet storage space and obviously well appointed, but the concept would be to architecturally continue with that theory of what we have, which is to cap the entire deck. And we're just trying to seek the utility. And, um, you know, while we recognize, you know, this density component, we are coming down below some of the other projects. Obviously, I know Mr. Coviello was not concerned necessarily about what those other projects look like, but certainly what we look like. And I think that we are coming, bringing it down. And the fact that we're <clears throat> able to park it now without a variance, because that'll eliminate that variance for any need and request brings us a little bit more into alignment. And I, and I recognize that from the board's perspective, you know, whether it's 15 or being kind of a magic number for them, please appreciate the fact that, you know, coming from 19 to 16 is a big reduction for us. And, and I hope the board takes that in consideration given the fact that we're also um, not able to provide a one bedroom COA unit. So we, we are, you know, providing some pretty significant housing elements and components for future um, contribution to the Berkeley Heights um, affordable housing requirements. Uh, Mr. Tobia, did you have any closing comments? Um, I will tell you, Mr. Chairman, um, the offer of uh, the 16 unit settlement, if you will, 
will take this job down to 28.6 units per acre, um, six units per acre less than when we started back on September 24th. Okay. If that helps you, that, that new number. Uh, so we're getting down closer to 20 units per acre. And you know, Ms. Sullivan, you know, you and I have done a lot over the years in the business district. You know, I want you to just share with you very briefly uh, planning 101 in business districts. And what I've learned over the years is more housing is better. Okay. And we know you're trying to fix a parking variance here and trying to moderate density. Uh, but everywhere I look where there's more housing in the business district, I see successful business districts. And um, there, there's this strong correlation between people who live within uh, a few hundred feet of a restaurant and people who have to drive within a, a few miles of a restaurant. And I want you all to understand more housing is better within, within reason, of course. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Toby, I, as always, I appreciate it, and thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Mr. Hughes, any closing comments from the planning? Yeah, I mean, nothing really further from my own. I would just say, you know, it can always get tricky when you start playing around with density numbers because you can always modify unit sizes, and next thing you know, it's still the same building, but it's just, you know, a fewer number of units. So, um, yeah, and I, I, I can't dispute what Mr. Tobia just said, which is that, you know, yes, more folks living in the downtown environment supporting local businesses is a good thing. That always has to be balanced against, you know, is this overdevelopment, can the property accommodate the proposed density? And that's ultimately what the board needs to consider. I appreciate it. Mr. Uh, Santori, before your summation, would your architect who's been patiently waiting have any comments or did you want to have her provide any additional testimony before we continue our dialogue? It's really for the uh, at the board's discretion. I guess I would just say this: we've obviously submitted roof deck details, which are all uh, included in there, showing yeah, very the very tasteful details. Very nice, by the way. Thank you, thank you. And then, um, you know, we tried to spend a good amount of time taking the board's feedback into inclusion. And I guess, Mr. Sullivan, just on the the topic of the solar, I just want to make sure we don't gloss over that. Is the board, you know, we recognize that we're going to be designing that away from the. The edges, um, there are certain areas where there's parapets, but there's also certain areas where there are railings. Um, but obviously there's this, this site is densely screened from all sides. Um, and I, I wanna make sure that we don't need to go back before any other additional board. If there's any comments, questions or concerns relative to that, because obviously it's a tremendous expense and we just wanna be able to get that done. Should this application advance, let's incorporate the solar proposal in the concept is, uh, I, I read a little bit about the the concept from the uh, the letter we received from the solar company. These are flush mounts, right? They're not moving following the rotation of of the sun or anything, right? These are stationary units. Stationary units. Stationary units. Okay, because different than the uh, the ones at the old Lucent, which is Al Alcatel. Yes. Uh, is they move? You know, yep. they, they follow the the axis. And these are less than 24 inches from the roof. Okay. No. Um, I would like to open up the meeting to members of the public one more time. Uh, Mr. Coviello, can I get a motion, please? I'll make a motion to open the mo uh, meeting to members of the public. And may I have a second by Mr. Uh, Ringwood, please? Second. Okay, the meeting is now open to any members of the public that have a question or comment regarding the application for 391 Springfield Avenue. If you could please open up the room, Mr. Coviello. The room is open. All participants are allowed to unmute themselves at this time. If you're having trouble, you can also send us a message in the chat. At this time, Mr. Chairman, there are no messages in the chat and no one is coming off mute on their own. Okay. Seeing that, and we've provided ample time for additional comments. May I get a motion to close, Mr. Cyburn? I'll move to close to the public. And a motion uh, and a second by Mr. Nappy, please. 
I'll second. A second by Mr. Nappy. Okay. Um, closing comments. Um, this project has come a long way. And, and some of my first comments were, you know, it's, this was born with the planning board and it was eight units over commercial. We've come a long way since September and now we're into the middle of November here. Um, I recognize the need for the COE units and I appreciate that that element is there. Um, it took me a little while to be convinced to consider a ground floor residential unit and I didn't think I would ever agree to something like that. I appreciate the co-op concept as a commercial providing the street frontage that still demonstrates the commercial corridor, which Springfield Avenue is. Uh, we've knocked around opportunities about density. We've discussed other projects. In my opinion, 15 units is the appropriate number of units, which is one, four, four, and uh, six for a total of 15. That's where I would feel most comfortable. Mr. Coviello. I would concur with, with everything you just said. I think there's been a lot of give and take on both sides. I think this is going to be a nice project. Uh, the original ask was for 19. The parcel is approved for 11 at its size. 15 is dead in the middle. And I feel comfortable at 15. And you, how about the ground floor unit? I, I'm okay with the ground floor. Again, I try, it's not something that I want, but in, in conceding some and they're giving some, I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, again, the commercial space in the front of the offices makes sense. It's never going to work as retail. No one's going to dispute that. And it, if this is the way it works best. Yeah, and I agree. Okay. And we have a tired parcel that's deserved something better. And I appreciate that Mr. Forrest has invested in the town that he's spent so much time on. Mr. Ringwood, please. Yeah. Um, the first floor, we've, as I said, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the proposal for the first floor. Um, I can appreciate the business aspects of making this a financially viable project. I think the alternative of, of a non-financial viable product and, and having that building continue to be unmaintained and vacant is, to me, outweighs uh, an extra unit. So I would be in support of the 16 units. Thank you very much, Mr. Ringwood. Mr. D'Elia? Um, I, I agree. Um, I originally said one or two units coming down. Um, I'm okay with the 16. I'm okay with the co-unit on the first floor. So I'm okay as proposed. Mr. Nappy? Yeah, I do have a question regarding the, re the 16 unit option. By, you, by going down to 28.6 and with the 16 units, does that change the square footage of the commercial space on, on the ground level? No, it would not. No. It doesn't at all, okay. Right. I, I would be inclined to be okay with the 16 units as well and, uh, keep, and, and keep the reduction at 28.6, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Parita. Um, after listening to all the testimony, I think, uh, the 16 units is, is a good compromise and I'd be okay with that. Thank you. Uh, and you're okay with the ground floor? Yes, I'm okay with that as well. Um, Mr. Sylvester. I'm okay with the ground floor and 15 or 16 seems reasonable. Okay. Do you have and a preference? Do you have a preference of the number? 15. 15. And Mr. Cyburn. Well, I've liked, um, since we started this whole project, I liked everything that's went on from all the way through. I like um, the solar. I like the parking. I like um, the commercial on the bottom. I even don't mind the co-op on the bottom floor because it's tucked behind. Uh, I am leaning on and toward 15 units. That's what I, I think is a happy medium because originally it was 11. We went from 19. I think we're cutting it in half now. So that's where I sit. So if I'm doing my math right, and I think you are. 
<laughs> we have a tie. <laughs> We're pretty much right in the middle. And I, and I guess this, I would just only only ask the board of this, and, and I know Mr. Sylvester is kind of between 15 and 16, and we're sitting very close here on this thing. Please appreciate the fact that when you're building out a project of this nature, considering the fact that everything is going to be of high quality, putting the solar in, there's a cost. Putting in the roof deck, there's a cost. Screening the property, there's a cost. Everywhere, at every corner's turn, there becomes a cost. I always worry about the risk of these buildings and projects when the adequate, um, you know, and I think Mr. Ringwood adequately, you know, sum summarize this, which is it would be a bigger problem to not adequately develop it to get the functionality of the use that's intended. And I, I, I can just tell you this from my perspective, many years ago, I was before the planning board on my own project and I compromised on a couple of variances that ended up disintegrating my project in the long run. And it cost me my life savings at the time by simply yielding on a front yard versus a rear yard setback, which made the properties unmarketable because the rear yards were not adequate for when people came. Every time they came, they said the backyard's too small, the backyard's too small. That's kind of one of these things that I get in this instance, you know, is that we obviously, we have come a long way. Cutting three units is a major impact financially to the project. And obviously numerics are always part of any project. Capping the deck, making the structural repairs, and making this into a, a extremely functional project requires capitalization, even from a long-term perspective. Thankfully, Mr. Force is willing to make those investments in the community, but I would just, you know, urge the board to consider that element, considering all of the things that we're doing and all the, you know, the kind of the high-end improvement that's being made to try and turn this building into what it hasn't been. We all know this building has been underutilized and empty for forever, and we don't, we don't want to, you know, return to that. And you know, putting, sticking a three-bedroom unit in along with the other units, it's it's the same size building, and we can park it. So I just urge that if the board could reconsider to possibly, you know, how they feel about that 16th unit would be of great appreciation to us. Uh, Mr. Sylvester, how do you feel about the 16th unit? Uh, Mr. Santor, I understand what he just said it's they've got to make a profit i want to see something done there i want that building improved if it's one extra room i'm sort of okay with it now after listening to mr santor yep and and i appreciate that and i did not i had no intention of putting you on the spot you were just the first person i saw um i can support the 16 units as well. I think Mr. Coviello and Mr. Cyburn also expressed concern about 15s. Uh, Mr. Cyburn, how do you feel about a 16th unit? And I, I can go, I can go 16. I understand exactly what Mr. Santori is saying. And I understand everything that they're going through. I'm just going by the numbers and going the happy medium, but 16 it is fine. I mean, it, it'll get them to the mark they want. They've spent so much time on this and I don't want to see an empty space there either. And Mr. Coviello. I don't think we need a unanimous vote to move it forward, so. Um, are you firm on, I'm just, are you firm on 15? Yeah, I mean, I guess, look, you, you, you bought a, you, you made an investment in a project going in. There's always risks in the project when you, when you purchase it. You had an opportunity to remodel the front of the building to make it, viable. We're not offering that. We're not pushing the retail. We're giving a lot of leeway in some things that we could hold ground on and, and we're not. Uh, so again, when you make an investment, you, you did so with risk. Uh, you went before the, the planning board, you were approved for something and you're coming here to get uh, a little bit more. And I think you're got a lot more, right? Because none of this was, is, was a given. Uh, 11 is permitted. 15 or 16 is, is, is a, is a gift. So again, I, I will stay on my 15. I think we've given everything else. And I, I appreciate your point because the applicants is well aware we could have voted to deny and they could have built a, an eight unit building which would have defeated the purpose and the spirit of the downtown. So I think we came out with a fair result um, 16 reasonable units. I think this is a very unique parcel 
It is a long, narrow parcel. Most of the building and especially the new improvements, the garage is really hidden by the tower and the annex is hidden by the tower. I think the amenity deck, if done the right way, is just gonna be a real cool feature there in downtown. And I, I hope it attracts and fills the, uh, the units immediately. So with that said, um, can I get a motion to, uh, Amanda, do we need to chat about conditions? We can if you would like to, otherwise I can put all the ones that I remember that are in my notes and then if you have to add to it, we can do that. Okay, why don't we put them together and then of course we'll run a sample of the uh, conditions and the resolution passed to uh, Mr. Santori as well prior to final adoption. That's Good. perfectly fine. Yes. Um, we appreciate the design team's efforts. Uh, we owe, our goal is to, to strive for a product and make it a better product. This board, I'm, I'm very proud to have been serving for as long as I've been, and especially working with Bob and some of the members since 2005. We've had some challenges and we've had very successful projects on the commercial end and the, re the residential end. I think the gas station on Emerson Lane really took a 180, Mr. Santori, and we appreciate your willingness to I try work and your, the applicants because you know it's a pleasure driving down Plainfield Avenue to see how a gas station can fit into a residential neighborhood. So and, you know, I, I, I think I, we get to- I, I must say that was the first one we did too that we were actually online. So it was kind of challenging to go through all that. Definitely was. And, you know, look, I, I think that, yeah. you know, I echo your sentiments, Mr. Sullivan. You know, I've obviously been peering for the board for a very long time. I try and spend a lot of my time and, you know, our design team in this instance, we've been meeting two, three hours a week um, so I, I do want the board to understand that we've not been, we've, we've considered this every single comment and piece of information that's been provided to us with great uh, deliberation and great preparation. And, and obviously we wanted to come up with the best possible project for the town. And, um, you know, and, and I'm glad that as usual, the board and an applicant can work together and it's always, uh, it's good to come out with a nice project. So thank you guys again for uh, your reasonableness and, uh, you know, doing a great job. Great, thank you. And Mr. Tobia, thank you. It's always good to see you. I know it's been some time, but you know, thank you for spending time with the planning board. Likewise, with the architect and the engineering professionals this evening, we do appreciate your time as well as uh, Mr. Hughes. I haven't forgotten about you. We thank you very much for your dedication to the best interest of, of Berkeley Heights. With that said, uh, Amanda's got the conditions under control. Can I get a Motion on this application, Mr. Ringwood, please. For that, can I just yes. clarify yes. that yes. all of the conditions set forth in the memos provided by our professionals will be stipulated to? Yes, uh, I don't believe there was any issues, right, Michael? We had no issues with the planner's memo, and obviously, Bill already stipulated earlier, so. Perfect. That's yes. correct, Augie. And the fire department memo email from September 23rd, there's an email from the fire department. I'll take a quick look at it. And then the downtown beautification committee as well. Stair towers, standpipes, emergency generator, and providing the fire alarm, knocks box. Yeah, I mean, I don't believe there was any issues with this, right? We, Michael, you've seen this before, correct? I have not seen that one, Augie. Okay. I believe we went through. Right. Nancy, we went through this one already, right? Yes, these are all fine. I have it here. It's all fine. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, yep. yep, not a problem with that. And then the last one was downtown beautification. Let's just take a quick look. Uh, Nancy, you've seen this one as well, correct? Yes. Yes, and we and I testified to all these points last time, so I don't yeah, think there was any issues. issues. Okay. Yep. And one okay. last clarification: the only variance in that will no longer be necessary is the parking. Correct. All the other ones remain unchanged. That would be correct. Right. Right. Okay. Perfect. 
And it was clarified just to write the planners um, memo uh, clarified that there was not a height variance required, but that's in the planners memo. Okay. Yeah. How, how are the parking spots calculated? How are they calculated? Right. Originally, they needed 37. We had 36. Um, We're dropping right. a unit, but adding a bedroom. So I, I think if I did the math correctly, because I did do that, and I know Bill is is no, I don't believe Bill no, is Bill's actually online. Oh, he is. Okay. So. But the answer, in simple terms, is the parking requirement would be reduced by two stalls. Right. We're shaving one unit. Uh, so instead of 37 required, we would be down to 35 with 36 proposed. I'm sorry for interrupting, then the board can go back to voting. Okay. Thank you very much for the clarifications, all. Um, I think you had a motion already. We, we had a motion by Mr. Ringwood and a second by uh, Mr. Parita. Yep, I'll second that. Second by Mr. I Parita. Don't think, oh. I don't think Mr. Parita is going to be voting. He's an alternate. Okay. Uh, oh, Mr., uh, I'll second. Mr. Nappy, thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Sullivan? Yes, considering all testimony. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. Nappy? Yes. Mr. D'Elia? Yes. Mr. Cobiello? No. Mr. Sylvester? Yes. Mr. Ringwood? Yes. Motion carried 6-1. Thank you very much. Good luck on the. Thank uh, you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. Have a great evening. Stay safe. Well. Thank you. Well, thank you Thanks very much. You all. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay. Have a nice Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Too. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, uh, Ms. Wolf, uh, regarding the annual report. The mm -hmm. annual report is a public report, correct? Correct. So the members members of the public are welcome to uh, listen to the conversation and ask questions. Is that correct? Sure, of course. Okay. Um, you in introduced the next the next the last uh, piece of business that we have. Let me just grab it. So as we discussed at our last meeting, we wanted to carry forward some of the same recommendations that we had made in the past, or at least find out where they stood. So I believe that we're doing that. We're carrying them all forward. And I do not believe we had any new recommendations yet, but we can discuss. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, did anyone have any comments uh, of additional land use items uh, to consider. I know we considered a fair amount in 2019 and what the plan is, is to take the 2019 recommendations, the 2020 recommendations, share them with the planning board, the planner, the engineer, and the borough council. We'll let council comment. I think technically it deserve, it, if we make recommendations, the recommendations are forwarded to the planning board. Planning board makes recommendations and the governing body ends up uh, incorporating that into the municipal land use should the ordinance pass. The annual report. The annual report and, and uh, improvements to the municipal land use. Correct. For example, we, we spoke about porticos. I, I think it's I think it's uh, yeah. ridiculous to have a, a small portico that encroaches into a front yard require a variance. You know, 36 square feet uh, is appropriate. It's a little awning to keep the Amazon boxes clean. It should be a slam dunk pass go and go right to the construction department and not be tied up in a 
board of adjustment application a small encroachment into a front yard. That's one of the examples. We spoke about, uh, I think, uh, sports courts, incorporating sports courts into a language. use yeah. instead of having people that want sports courts, basketball courts, and permeable surfaces and the like appearing before the board of adjustment. Uh, size of accessory detached garages in height and size were another example that we shared with each other in 2019. These, these are things that we just need to dot the I's and cross the T's in the best use of municipal land use, which will impact how Tom Bacos makes his determinations and it'll impact whether or, or not they, the applicant needs to appear before the Board of Adjustment. Um, Samantha, I'm sorry, uh, Amanda, any additional comments regarding uh, some of what we've proposed in the past or suggestions? No, I think they're all good suggestions, recommendations. I don't know that we have any new ones per se. I think we've seen a lot of the same issues reoccur. Mr. Covial, did you have a couple of comments regarding? Yeah, so our form, the application to the Zoning Board of Adjustments, is that something that would be reviewed in this at this time? We could make recommendations. Do you think they're too long, too confusing? Well, it, it, um, it's inaccurate. Okay. So if you look at our application to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, uh, section five, uh, down below in B, where it states the area of an exist, existing or proposed accessory items, detached garages and sheds are not part of accessory items. They are part of structures, according to Tom Baco. Anything with the roof, would be considered a structure. So the calculation is falling into the wrong part. So it's just a wording on the document in and of itself is wrong. We've discussed this with Mr. Warner in the past and to make a change, it's gotta be officially brought up, but the, the wording or the, where it's worded is incorrect. Okay. Is the board on board with adding that as a recommendation? I, I agree. I, I think the, the principal structure should be the standalone and everything else that's detached from the principal structure should be considered an accessory item. Detached garage, pool, shed, everything that should not be part of the principal calculation. Separate. And it currently that, is. That is, what, that is what controls the additional impervious coverage. A house has a number, 10%, 15%. But the 10% that's left for the other controls the size of pools. It controls the number of accessories. We have run into situations with a 650 square foot detached horse barn, shed, yep. large facility, cabana. We've run into plus a sports court, plus a pool, plus a patio. These are things, that's where you see the increase and the imbalance of municipal land use. I think the structure stays principal one, and then everything else is other coverage, and then you've got the total coverage to deal with. So yeah, the form does not work in the way the calculations are done today. The form is misleading. Yeah, and uh, to be honest with you to share, when I first started in Berkeley Heights, it was always just the principal structure and everything else was other. You know, every, and I respect all zoning officials in any town. Everyone has a difference of opinion and a difference of interpretation, and that's their interpretation of it. But if it's if it's crystal clear and black and white, and it's agreed upon by both the planning board and board of adjustment, and supported by the governing body, then we we move on. Yeah. So that was one, and then the other conversation was, and um, Keenan, you'll probably be able to help. So. Our, our side yard setbacks, right? It's a combined 30 is what the first number I look at is because if you're above 12 on both sides, but a combined 30, you match all three, right? Your two side yard setbacks and your combined yard. But we're okay with 12 on one side and then force 18 on the other to be, if, if 30 is the number, like what is what are they looking for when we do this from a planning aspect? Is it 12, because again, 12 is good enough on one side, but then it's gotta be 18 on the other to not have to apply for a variance for a side yard setback. And then combine yard setback, right? Because you would be under 30. So how, what are they looking for? 
Yeah, typically when you see that, it's because they're factoring that you need a, and I assume this is a residential district, a driveway on one side of the house. That's what that anticipates, a driveway plus, you know, some planted setback area. That's typically what, what's envisioned. I so mean, that's why they would the assume one side to be larger. I'm sorry? That's why they'd assume one side to be larger than the yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. Tom, do you have the same interpretation on that? Yeah, that's definitely my understanding as well. We always took it as a, you know, accessibility to the house with, with vehicles. That's all. Yeah. Or you could use a paper street. Or you could do that, which many people do as well. <laughs> yeah, because again, when people fill out our application, right, they'll fill out side yard setback 12 and the other side yard 18. And it's not really 18, it's 12. Both side yards can be 12. And then you would just fail combined side yard yeah. setback. It's not 12 and 18. And then some, so again, some people, when they're filling out our application, they'll fill it out 30 and then they subtract the two numbers, right? To put one in what it should be. And what it should be is 12, 12, 30. You have to, it, you have to get to 30 to not need it as a combined side yard setback. So you could be 12 on both sides and not need a side yard setback anywhere. So when you do that, if I'm good with 12, why do I need to be 30? Like, that's where I'm starting to, you know, like the math just doesn't work. And I don't want to change it. I'm just trying to understand it. Because if I, if, if 12 is good for both sides and I don't need a variance for it, why 30? Well, it's not 12 for both sides. It's 12 for one side. Right. And, 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 and the requirement of 18 on the opposite side is for driveway accessibility. But yeah. it's not. What do you mean? The, the requirement's not 18 on the other side. If it's if the combined side yards are thirty, the combined side yard has to be thirty to not apply for us for a combined side yard setback. But I could be twelve on both sides and not have a side yard setback variance. I don't need to be above twelve. That's my that's what I'm talking about. You only have to have greater than twelve to equal the thirty for the combined. But twelve is the side yard setback on both sides. It's not one or the other side, it's either side. Well, it's, it's a minimum of 12 on either side, right? right. But, so if on have, one, but if I'm I sorry. 12, if I have 12 on both sides, I'm good for side yard setbacks. Yeah, but you don't meet, you don't meet them. You don't meet the combined cup. You don't meet the combined setback. So you need a variance. I need, I need one variance. Right. So that's correct. That, one, one variance for the combined number. That's one, correct. Var one variance for the combined number. Correct. So, what is the most, as we're sitting here, I'm not looking to change it, but as we talk to applicants, what is the most important number that we should be looking at when we're discussing these projects with them? Is it a fair combined yard setback? Is it a good single yard setback on each side should be at a minimum, right? Because sometimes we see we're at nine on one side and we get the side. So what is the more important number, the combined or the single side by itself? I think the single side by itself. Single, yeah, I think the single, single side. side. Yeah. Is the, gov is the governing part of it. Right. And don't forget, so drive driveways can't be within five feet of a property line to begin with, right? So not supposed to be. Correct. Not, well, not supposed to be. <laughs> That's the grandfather law. Yeah, no, no, I was just asking, because it was as you're going through these sheets, right, and people are filling them out, yeah. and we have these conversations with homeowners, what are we, what are we you know, we're discussing it with them. So the, the side yard, single side yard setback is more important than the combined 30. Yes. Okay, so you're the two professionals. That's why I wanted to keep you on to make sure. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with that statement. I do right. as well. Yep. That was it, Ray. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Ringwood, any comments or? Uh... I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, Ray. And how did you feel about the overall report? Are, we, are you in support of the report? I am. Yes. Mr. Sylvester, I am in support of the report. Okay, and uh, how about the comments? This evening, do you support some of the comments that were made of additional items to improve the interpretation of the municipal land use? Specifically? Some of the items that we spoke about, like the porticos, the combined, the, the minimum side yard setbacks. Mm -hmm. I don't see why a portico has to be uh, appear in front of us. Yeah, I, that's just one one example of many that we had. Correct, and I agreed with the others. The, the uh, units they're not uh, not part of the principal structure. Yes. 
Mr. Parita, any comments? No, I mean, uh, you know, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in favor of it. Mr. Delia. Yeah, no, I agree. And we've been talking about some of those changes for a while. Can you say the, I missed the last word, Bob. No, we've, we've been talking about some of those changes for a while. Mr. Seibert? Yeah, everything we've talked about, Mr. Chairman, I mean, we've we've discussed this from last year and this year, and I think it's good with the side yard setbacks to get that cleaned up. I agree with what Mr. Caviella said. We had a little um, um, determinations of things right now, and thank you guys for uh, clarifying that. And the porticos definitely needs to come off the table. I mean, we really don't need to be revisiting this over and over and over again. Well, so. just remember, we didn't just put porticles on there, right? And that's why yeah. when, well, porticles when was, is just the one example. I think Amanda might no, have. No, no, but the portico, when we talked about it, it's porticos and front porches. Yeah. And this is why I was wondering, like, because we didn't get any feedback from the, from the planning board on what they liked or didn't like. And it's like, if they Correct. like the portico yeah. idea, but not the front porch, I'd strip the front porch off because, yeah. Ray, you're right, the portico is the, the better piece. Yeah. What what I think happens is we, we spent a fair amount of time in 2019 mm -hmm. and th the pandemic hit. And I okay. think the pandemic just threw everything out of whack. People weren't sure of how to react to Zoom. You know, we're in the Zoom environment now. It's not the same as being on the dais in town hall. And I think that priorities changed and you know, land use could have, you know, slipped on, uh, you know, on, on the back burner because there were other priorities that needed to be addressed. So uh, Amanda and Steve have incorporated our comments for 2019 and 2020 in the 2020 report. And that's what, that's where we are now. But I, you know, I, I will be proactive with the mayor and council and uh, the planning board. I know Steve Warner is talking to, is it, Bill Robertson. Bill Robertson. They're, they're, they're in communication. There's, there's a lot of uh, shared information already from some of the Zoom calls we've had regarding protocol and uh, the law. So I, I think we're in a better place going into 2021. And I, I think a common ground between the Board of Adjustment and the Planning Board, this is going to be one of the steps in that direction. Mr. Nappy, any comments? No, it's all good. Mm -hmm. I, I agree agree with everything we discussed. Um, and, and I tell you, I just went over that with my own pool project last season with the accessory coverage and the and the and the uh, primary. Okay. So that that's definitely uh, an area where that was confusing. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Pareda. Yep, it's I'm all good with it. Makes sense. So uh, pretty Hopefully they take some action on it uh, in the upcoming year. Okay. And Amanda, any additional comments regarding the report and action that needs to be taken at this time? So then I will add the form recommendation, correct? That they look at the forms and consider revising. Do you want me to mention the side yard setback? No, I was just, I just wanted more clarification on, on you know, okay. and what our professionals think that when we're looking at applications, what we should take more into consideration. So it was more definitely the, the, the 12 foot side. Yeah. Cause okay. I don't want to look at changing any of that. That'd be a headache anyway. It was just more clarification. So thank you. Okay. So then I will add that additional recommendation. And I don't know if the board wants to trust me to make that recommendation and we can vote on it tonight, or if you want to carry it and we can vote at the next meeting. Why don't, why don't we take care of business this evening? We, we, we trust you. Okay, so then I'll revise the report. And I'll send it out. Okay. And um, so we need to take a voting action, correct? Yes. So then does Regina take over at this point? And how do you, how was the recommendation? So I know that we've got it correct. A motion to adopt the annual report as revised. Okay. With that said, Regina, please. Who's making the motion? Oh, uh, can I get a motion by Mr. Coviello? I'll make a motion to a adopt to Mr. Ringwood this evening. Seconded. We have a second by Mr. Ringwood and roll call. Roll call. Mr. Sullivan? Yes, thank you. Mr. Cyburn? Yes. Mr. Nappy? He just 
Oh, out. his battery, his battery just cut out. I just got a text from him. Okay, Mr. Zalia. Yes. Mr. Coviello. Yes. Mr. Sylvester. Yes. Mr. Ringwood. Yes. Mr. Pareda. Yes. Um, his, his battery died and his pizza was just delivered from Marcello. So I guess we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that said, um, Amanda, we've taken care of our business. You have. Can I get a motion to open up the meeting to members of the public? Uh, I motion. Mr. Parita. We have a motion by Mr. Parita, second by Mr. D'Elia. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The meeting is now open to members of the public that have a question or comment for the Board of Adjustment this evening. Mike Coviello, can you just check the room? There are no members of the public. Seeing no one, can I get a motion to close Mr. Parita? I'll make a motion to close to the public. Can I get a second by Mr. Sylvester? I make a motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And the meeting, can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll move. We have a motion by Mr. Cyber and a second. I'll second. second. By Mr. Ringwood, all in favor? Aye. 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 Folks, thank you very much. Uh, Keenan and Tom, thank you very much for sticking it out a little bit later this evening. I was trying to get you in and out, but I do appreciate you hanging around and sharing your comments on behalf of the application as well as the Board of Adjustments annual report. Much appreciated, and we're always here to help and support you. So we thank you. Good to see you guys again. Anytime. Well, it, it, you well, everyone, have a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy, and then we'll see each other again in December. Thank you. All right. Stay well. Have a great one, guys. Night.